Part of what we've been dealing with is uh, the education that we get that's based on fraudulent information and lies. And since the exhibit is back now after some two decades of absence from the United States, when ASCAC met this exhibit from another exhibit on Tutankhamun from uh, or in California, in Los Angeles, and gave it a proper welcome and also announced to the world that King Tut was back and he was black. And the t-shirts were there to welcome him and so they uh, started a debate even on that spot that was picked up by the Grand Clegg at the De Young Museum where my wife was a docent and she was the one responsible for getting that to the De Young Museum. And at that point, the Grand Clegg did the interview uh, that cost an Egyptologist, they tell me, it cost him his job, Kent Wink, who was at the University of California, and who couldn't defend himself in the face of a head-to-head -head discussion on the merits of the case as to whether this was really an African man or not. You would have thought that they would have given up at that point, but since we know that they never gave up when uh, Brother Tifil Obenga Sheikh Anta uh, did the Cairo Symposium in 1974 and in uh, just a surgical order laid out the case in empirical science for who Africans were and therefore who the family of Tutankhamun was. And the 11 categories of empirical evidence that were presented there uh, should have uh, stopped everything. Uh, those of us who are in ASCAC know those arguments quite well. But here we come back now with a new supposedly scientific edition. And so I want to simply uh, share just a very few slides addressing the issue of the uh, phenotypical makeup of King Tutankhamun and to show how easy it is to destroy what is now another attempt at falsehood. Um, and so we'll go ahead with it. Uh, if, uh, this is a collage. And by the way, I have to thank Dr. Ben for so many things. But for those of you who know Dr. Ben's works, you know that they're so full of documentation that it's hard to read. We're used to getting uh, pablum in uh, publications. And Dr. Ben loads, as did Joel Rogers before him, loads his um, presentations, not just his speeches, but his publications with documentation. And so I'm influenced greatly by those two men in terms of a method of presenting information. So what I've tried to do is to collect together here uh, the uh, collage that had the African family on the right and picking the most important information about those families, which is the actual images of the mummies in most cases of the 18th dynasty, which is the dynasty of Tutankhamun, that, it, that means that those are his relatives, including one who is in the upper right-hand corner, said to be both, uh, by some people, his mother, others uh, that uh, suggested some, that uh, Akhenaten and someone else was the father and mother of Tutankhamun. I actually happen to believe it was uh, Queen T. In fact, he even looks like her. But that's the uh, physical uh, carving of Queen T, but there's also the mummy of Queen T that we have. And there are other mummies in here, and those are the types of mummies that Dr. Sheikh Antetrop was trying to uh, be able to perform the melanin dosage test that was created and uh, presented in Cairo. And uh, the mummies that had been examined by him in the Museum of Man in Paris uh, had uh, indeed shown themselves to have the same melanin content as black people, you would expect. We shouldn't even have to go through this, but the fact is that if we need to go through it, we can easily go through it and blow people away. And it's that kind of powerful evidence that then was uh, compared to, here's, here's the foreign people over here on the left. The Greeks on the bottom, Alexander the Great, and before uh, the Ptolemy queen, uh, uh, Cleopatra the Seventh, and the Persian queen Nefertiti, who a lot of us spend a lot of time 
uh, trying to claim as African, whether she was or wasn't, that remains to be seen, but at least one uh, uh, Egyptologist has done a lot of work uh, looking at the uh, fact that she's linked and is the actual Tadu Kippa who is supposedly, uh, maybe that's why her name is the beautiful one has come, she had come from Persia into Africa and is not in any way whether she's black or not is not material. The fact that she's foreign is what's material. So I put the foreigners on the left side and the Africans on the right side. So we would expect, if everybody in that family is looking like everybody in this room, then we would expect that the mummy of Tutankhamun, which is down in the lower right, and the golden mask, which is the eyewitnesses depiction of Tutankhamun, that that body of evidence by itself would uh, uh, help us to understand that he was indeed a, a native African person. Now there's other information uh, that was put out in the uh, 11 categories of empirical evidence, linguistic information, historical information, eyewitness testimony, uh, other aspects of phenotype other than uh, what is shown just by examining the head. But apparently in order to get this exhibit back into the United States, uh, Zawi Hawass and company decided that they had to come back in power. It was something that hadn't been done before. So they decided to use CT scan technology on the skull of the mummy. They gave the skull to two different, actually three different groups of scientists who supposedly were forensic capable. Uh, one group in France, one group in the United States, one group in Egypt. And so there are actually three examinations from the CAT scan information on that skull given to these three groups of people. And supposedly what that produces is a more accurate rendering of the image of Tutankhamun than anything else. A more accurate, in other words, it ought to be better, less guesswork, if you're going to add something new at this stage of the game. So let's find out if they had less guesswork. Next slide. Um, we'll go on past it, Sheikh uh, Antijaf and Dr. Obinger and Jaff, that's the real one there. Uh, this is the uh, evidence that they presented in, at the Cairo Symposium on that question of what these people look like. Next, um, a, a, a close-up of just the women because there's more of them that still had the braid attached to the uh, skulls uh, and the braids in, in addition to the physical shape of the of the uh, of the mummy, when when you have the uh, uh, the cornrows in some cases, especially with Tete Sherry in the center, uh, with the short nappy head cornrows on her, uh, you've got uh, Nefertari, her daughter, her granddaughter, just to the right of her. You've got Queen T's mummy, and that goes with the face that the uh, artist saw. And then you have other royals at the bottom, including an unknown royal, Lady Ray, who got extensions as well as the cornrows. And you got one that looks almost like she's wearing locks. You know, that's a new Tawi. Uh, I'm sorry, Amos and Hapi. So then we go from that to the new evidence. We're looking at the royal family, and we expect that young man to look like his family. Uh, unless they can find some paternity somewhere else and maternity somewhere else than the ones that have been shown to. Uh, these are some of the ones in his line, Nefertari, again, uh, the, the, at the beginning of that dynasty, uh, Tetishiri, uh, her son, second Enre, Tao, his daughter, Nefertari, and the mummy of Nefertari, painting of Nefertari, and the three mummies, and they're all tied together as uh, genetic kin. Next. How about this? I could not be further down the line. That's one of my graduate students mm -hmm. who's almost a spitting image of I could not. Uh, let's go to the next one. That's a second. Per this just happens to be in Atlanta. I could come to Philadelphia, New York, Boston, uh, Los Angeles, Atlanta, and I could find people who would match what was supposed to be a distorted image, as they say about Akhenaten, that he was sick, that there was something wrong with him and everything, 
because they say he was abnormal. And the abnormality in the physical renderings of Akhenaten was supposed to be swollen lips, flesh, uh, fleshy nose, and so forth and so on. But here it is with two other people. The one on the right is actually the son of one of the former professors at Morehouse College, Sam Williams. And the one on the left, Shati Omasadi, who is one of my students now, uh, Akhen Priestess in Ghana. And then when you put them together with Akhenaten, we get some additional information uh, to peruse. And then next, uh, the attempt to take Tutankhamen is old. This was one where they were trying to do it with comic strips. And in the right, you see the comic book that went to the kids with the note, the home game, supposed to be advertising for a game that you waited 3,000 years for. You notice they paint him as a European in, in that. So we waited 3,000 3, years for a European Tutankhamen. Uh, but there's the comparison between that image and the golden mask and, of course, the shape of the, uh, the skull itself. But at, now to the skull itself. The CAT scan or CT scan uh, is a way of imaging the uh, skull so that you can give like an x-ray, except it's a CT uh, technology, to a group of scientists to do their forensic work and recreate what they think the skin was and what they think the, the pigment was. And so let's go to what they did. So there's the results of the three different efforts to take CT scan so that they could have a new image of Tutankhamen that had never been there before. The one on the left is what the French group came up with. The one in the middle is what the Egyptian group came up with. The one in, on the right is what the United States came up with. I think the only one that didn't know that they had the mummy of the king was the one on the right. I think the United States was flying blind. They, they, what do you think this person looked like? But here's the evidence that where the people who bring this argument hang themselves. If CT scan is supposed to be more accurate rather than less, and it's supposed to be the definitive thing, then how come all three of those don't look identical? How come you've got three different images from a scientific process that's supposed to have less error in it? Okay, that's one thing. Then let's move from that into what they chose, of course, was the, the image on the left, the one that looked most uh, debatably uh, European in, in appearance, in phenotype. And so that's the one that now travels with the exhibit. The other two are left behind, by the way. They become ambiguous. But this one is less ambiguous. And so then we go on to the next thing. And here are the three questions that have to be asked. You have to ask the question, if CT scan is more accurate science, how do we get three distinctly different images? It seems to me if you get three different ones, you, don't, you haven't added anything to the debate. Number two, soft tissue cannot be determined by the CAT scan. So the nose, the lips, and things like that, the CAT scan from a skull does not give you that information. But they went ahead and added the soft tissue in European form. Third, Pigment cannot be determined from CT scan. So they chose to make it white rather than black. That's, a, that's an arbitrary choice. So it, it's hard to see how anybody could claim that to be science and force that off. But of course, you've got a waiting public that's waiting for a new image of King Tut, hopefully to open the door to the possibility that others could be uh, done in the same way. So in other words, I'm just saying that uh, if you get a chance to ask, and some of the people have been asking at the exhibit area, I've got a couple of examples of students who have gone into the exhibit and asked those exhibitors these questions, and people start stuttering and backing up and so forth, but it's also interesting that you don't have what they had in 1974, which was uh, about 20 people who were all coming together face to face on neutral territory to have the debate on what these physical types look like. What you have is the decision unilaterally by people led by the director of antiquities to handpick his people 
and to not have peer review, so to speak, is what I'm saying. And so that's how they got their results. And finally, we say no more extreme makeovers. And of course, Los Angeles came up with this, uh, uh, the Los Angeles ASCAP came up with this uh, poster, and we think that everywhere this exhibit goes, we ought to take the no more extreme makeover uh, image with it. So I just wanted to throw that out there, even though that's not the essence of what it was I came to talk about, but we, I couldn't resist uh, doing that. Um, <clears throat> also, I, I did this. I mentioned that uh, in the board meeting that uh, about a month ago, the black lawyers who are intellectual property, uh, they have an organization of black lawyers uh, that protect intellectual property. And they decided they wanted to explore the history of science in ancient Egypt. And of course, I don't think they had in their minds separated the Arabic latecomers from the ancient Egyptians. And so they went to praise the ancient Egyptian science. And, uh, uh, but they wanted to do it by holding their annual meeting in the embassy in, uh, uh, in uh, 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 D.C. And so they invited me to be their speaker. And I went with this information and evidence. And the um, ambassador wasn't there, but the number two person was there. And he actually sat through what I just presented for you and a whole lot more, uh, dealing with the uh, uh, contribution to ancient uh, Egypt to science, but also specifically on this exhibit, which is now running around uh, trying to muddy the water on who Africans are. Then we now know why it is that people have to do that. And, might add that the, um, I did get a request for the images, which I haven't yet sent, but will, to the uh, embassy official, uh, who at that point didn't know that he wasn't supposed to be impressed and announced that he was impressed, but I think he hadn't talked to Howard Hawass yet. And maybe at that point, uh, he'll change his mind on whether he wants to know anymore or not. So at any rate, uh, let me get back to, because uh, this is one of the things we have to tell our children is the tortured way in which people manipulate evidence in order to construct falsehood and how they hide from true intellectual engagement and conversation. We had an opportunity to do this, uh, Dr. Obinga and several others, Martin Bernal and others. We went down to Miami when the exhibit opened down there and we had a wonderful time down there as well. Um, again, uh, when, when you do bring people out in the open, usually they run. Uh, Dr. Asante had the, uh, 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 it was a conference on Martin Bernal's book, Black Athena, here at uh, Temple University some years ago. And uh, you really need to get the videotapes and to see how people had to back up. The classics department came out supporting the African studies position. And then you had a few Assyriologists that began to uh, uh, try to make up some real weird stuff which was adequately handled, uh, quite adequately, by Dr. Charles French. Uh, he was going skull to skull with, uh, I think it's Ak Actos, or I can't remember the, the scholar's name, who came up with some weird notion about the Syrians teaching the Egyptians certain kind of technology. All inferential, none in terms of science, and so forth. So when people get into those kind of battles, and that's what I'd like to say to our children, that when they talk battles, in hip hop for example, they need to know that there's also intellectual battles that are just as uh, exhilarating <laughs> and we're winning those battles as well and we will continue to win those battles. Um, what I'd like to do in the brief time I have remaining is to uh, enter this discussion that we've been having over the last few days, I think this has been one of the most wonderful ASCAC that I've ever attended. Uh, the presentations have been absolutely magnificent. Um, uh, I, I don't know where else you would ever go to get a better demonstration of what African people can do with scholarship, uh, to listen to Mario and what he had done. And, uh, Dr. Obenga, of course, is his own inimitable self. So. 
Greg, I just have to say something special about him because a lot of us do all this dry talk in academics, but to bring dry academics to life, yes. that's yes. what Greg does. He stands on solid ground, but when he begins to connect all the different ways that we know, the ways that we know in music, the way that we know in art, the way we know in literature, with the way that we know in physics and chemistry and mathematics, and brings all that together and then hooks it up with the moral compass that we're supposed to have, you know, and integrates so much of this stuff and then communicates it in a way that even the babies can understand it. That's an incredible gift, and I'm very thankful for it. But I want to not go back to the pyramids, that's too far back in this time, to you, and plus you've already had it done quite well. Don't want to go back to Timbuktu, uh, we need to do more of that, Dogon and so forth, to the Zulus and what have you. But let's go to 1865 for a minute. And let's look at what was happening as Africans came out of enslavement. And let's listen to the reporting of what they did when they came out of enslavement. So I want to read just a few of these so you can get a flavor for what was happening in light of what was being said about the Renaissance, the repetition of the birth, in light of what's being said about Ma'at even in light of what's been said about a lot of things that we've talked about. So here, here we go. Uh, a couple of times I'm gonna use the term freed man, but it'll only be because I slip. What I'm trying to do is to read the quote that I'm taking, and everywhere it says freed man, say Africa. We gotta really look at any kind of writing about us and be careful about any name that we allow to be used. If you say freedmen, that does not acknowledge the fact that they were still Africans during the whole time that they were enslaved on plant plantation. And if you think that there's something called a freedman that's not an African, then you don't look for the cultural hookups and the identity that's necessary to finish the description of what it is you're trying to do. So these Africans came off of the plantation and here's a quote that says, a teacher at Port Royal declared that he could not set forth anything in adequate term to describe the eagerness with which the Africans applied themselves, young and old, to the task of learning the alphabet. They were cold, dirty, half-naked, but eager to learn. Their students were not concerned with what they could receive in food and clothing. Their students were anxious to feel sure that they would have the privilege of coming to school every day. So this is the young people and old people who became students in 1865. And it's so massive, that's why I want to read several different quotations. This comes from the book by uh, Dr. Bouchard, uh, and I can get the exact uh, citation for you if you're interested. As late as 1867, a couple years later in Washington, D.C., with the greatest concentration of Africans' teachers, 70 in that year still had hundreds of children seeking schooling, but being reluctantly denied. The children sought schooling in spite of great distances, in spite of inadequate clothing, very little meat, in spite of opposition from employers or former masters, they were observed spelling words and reading during their play, during their chores, and in their cabins. Many teachers conducted night schools as well as day schools to accommodate the aspirations of workers. Thousands of black men attained literacy while serving in the army, learning from chaplains, or interested off-duty enlisted men. Numerous observers reported black soldiers, workers, and travelers with their primers and readers, snatching moments of rest to study their lessons, or mothers in the midst of their child, 
children trying to learn from the children what they had learned in school during the day. The intense debate for knowledge and literacy was reflected in the classroom. Teachers and observers marveled at the African's serious application to schoolwork, rapid advancement, evidence of mental equality with whites. This is what white people are saying, that they had come off the plantation with evidence of mental equality with whites. They missed it because they had more than equality. They will compare very favorably. This, these are missionaries. I think with our Boston schools, wrote a Quaker teacher, an American Missionary Association instructor declared that in 10 years of teaching in the North, he had never seen greater advancement in school in the same amount of time. In seeking, establishing, and supporting its own schools for children, the people were phenomenal. In other areas throughout the South, the blacks initiated schooling whether or not Northern aid was available. In 1867, at the height of Northern support, the Freedmen's Bureau superintendent for Arkansas reported a backlog of requests for teachers in locating where the blacks had raised funds for schoolhouses and wages. The Africans in Virginia were building schoolhouses before teachers were available. The former vice president of the Confederacy testified before the Joint Committee for Recon Reconstruction that in Georgia, the inside the schools established by the Bureau, the blacks were themselves establishing the schools for themselves. While some of these black initiated schools were adopted by the aid societies, many others about which little is known, operated entirely on the strength of the black community. Furthermore, the blacks were a major source of financial support sponsored by the Northern Society. Northern Society sponsored the school, but we're paying for them. For example, the Africans raised over $23,000 for education in 1867 and built 60 schoolhouses. In addition, they paid taxes that went through to white schools while they're building schools for themselves. In other words, the freedmen found money for schools out of their grinding poverty, beginning a new life with nothing save uh, coarse clothing and a few belongings carried out of bondage. Often without housing, they found education sufficiently important to pay for it. The Baltimore Association admitted confidentially to its colleagues in the AFUC that the level of support from blacks was a heavy tax upon them in this season of scant labor, no jobs, and other recognized the sacrifices that they were making. Black, but here, Black demand, as they're building these schools, black demands for control and autonomy were usually muted as, or veiled by the aid society, who preferred to picture their charges as docile. Nonetheless, evidence exists suggesting that the Africans sought to extend their independence from whites through the control of their education institutions to come off the plantation knowing that you knew better than anybody else how to educate your children. You see it over and over again. The, uh, uh, at Savannah, Georgia in 1865, that's right at the emancipation, provides a particularly clear study of the demand for black control over school. There, despite the existence of the American Missionary Association and the New England Freedman Society, the blacks organized their own aid society, the Savannah Education Association. The association schools were entirely self-supported, relied exclusively on local black community for their support, and had all black faculty, including James Porter, who is the one that started the public school system in Georgia, by the way, as a legislator, and friend of Henry McNeil Turner, who was the founder of the Republican Party in Georgia, those two legislators who were put out of the legislature were the ones that founded the school. That one was one of the ones who had started his own school like so many other people. Uh, William Gannett wrote, they have a natural and praiseworthy pride in keeping the educational institution in their own hands. 
There is a jealousy of the superintendents of the white man in this matter. What they desire is assistance without control. This is something. I mean, <laughs> I'm going to read a couple more because I just want, I just wish that our community today had the image of what they were when they came immediately out of the enslavement process. Because we got people who are on their hands and knees going to people, begging them for scholarships, begging them to please bring some of your special expertise in and please teach us how to teach our children. We got black colleges that are going to grant makers, asking them to please send us some white folks to teach our faculty members how to teach the teachers that they're training how to uh, learn the program. In fact, the name of that program is Success Law. Our children aren't in the top four of the they're taking that program. But can you imagine the accrediting association giving a grant to black colleges, almost everyone that has a teacher education program, even more, can you imagine the colleges accepting that in the case that they take this money in order to be taught how to teach their students how to teach reading, meaning how to teach this way of teaching reading only. And that's an higher education somewhere. And you're bragging because you got a grant. That's a different Negro That's it. than the one that came off the plantation in 1865. That's right. Control of the schools was never a reality for long, however. Effective and continuous control presupposed community solidarity and group proximity. The dispersal of the African onto isolated plantations their further isolation onto individual tenant farms and the plantation, the refusal of denominational, denominational societies to provide access and control over the school, and the creation of white controlled public education in the southern areas, that's what destroyed the vital community power base mm. in education mm. in the south. I'm sorry. A couple more if I can find. When General Sherman, the Secretary of War, met with the leaders of Savannah's black community, asking what black people expected of the government, they heard no mention of schooling. Think about this in light of what I just got to say. They meet with the general and said, what do y'all want? Again, this was a very conscious group of Africans who met with General Sherman. So they didn't ask him for school. Why? Would they not ask for school if they cared so much about school? Let's look at this again. They, what they asked for was land. That's it, what they wanted. That's what we first needed. The interview was held just weeks after the blacks had already created the Savannah Education Association. They had their education in hand. That's why they didn't ask for education. And they knew that if they asked the general to help them with education, he would send control over the education process. Those are some slick black folk who knew what was getting ready to happen to them. And they did everything right from their angle to make sure that they kept the control of the children's education in their own hands. That's really the piece that I'm, I'm coming to because if we go back and we look at the time of trouble, remember now I'm back in the gimmick, where they talk about the period of trouble, renaming the period, the intermediate period, and the invasion period. I think it's a great uh, renaming of what it really was, the time of trouble, and taking that text, which named it where the Africans named that themselves, the time of trouble. They didn't name it as the intermediate period. They said it's a time of disorder. And what we got to do is the way him and pursue. We got to go back in the time of trouble and look at what it was like when we were not in trouble. Or look at what it was like when we were solving our own problems. To go back to that point and then start your historic use of historiography in order to set yourself up to solve your own problem. And so land was what they asked for. So that schooling could hardly have been far from their mind because they had already established the Savannah Education Association. It was simply not as central as other concerns for talking to Sherman. Likewise, the numerous black conventions of the mid-1860s in the South uh, in the South mentioned education. 
if at all, only in passing, these black conventions. Gratitude might be expressed for such schools as been provided by the North, but the calls to action or appeals for support were not focused on education when they were talking to white folk. Mm. There's a movie mm. with Richard Roundtree, Robinson Crusoe. You ought to get the movie because there, there's a couple little things in there I prefer not to even look at. But they have this contest between he and his master, Man Friday. Is being controlled by his master. And they go through a whole bunch of episodes. And eventually, both of them got to get their hat to get off the island. And they land and not only on that island or one like it, but they land at Friday's home. Where Friday's people open the door and welcome Friday and open the door and welcome Robinson Crusoe, who now has no power base. But what Robinson Crusoe does when he comes to Man Friday's home, he looks around and finds no use for himself. And then one night, and this is the scene I wish you would get to if you get that movie in your hand, when all the elders are sitting around the fire, and Robinson Crusoe is trying to find a place in the community, and he had asked, and they had nothing for him to do, because he had no skills. He been handling slaves who were handling his work. And so he said, well, I know what I can do. I will teach your children. Now, Friday had put up with a whole lot of Robinson Crusoe through the whole thing. He was insulted, beaten, threatened. Everything happened to Friday. Friday never broke, never did anything. But all of a sudden, Friday is a man gone wild. Not the children. We give him any job, but not the job of educating our children. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. It goes on like that. I got pages and pages and pages of testimony of what the Africans were doing and what they were asking for. And I, you know, I wish I could, uh, somebody might even want to carry this copy home with you. If you don't like that, I can email you. This, all you got to do is email me. You'll have more than you want to read. But basically, it's making the same point. So let me come back to why I wanted to start there rather than at the pyramid. Because obviously there have been many repetitions of the verb from pyramid there have been many times of trouble. And in the times of trouble, we always went back to our memory of what had happened first, to the September, to the first time, rather than to this time where we're at sea, where we're up against the rope, so to speak. We go back to the point where we had our mission clear. Mm -hmm. And then we ask, how do we act at that point? And then at that point, that's going to give us the guidance that we need to have. And so, when we got to that point here not too long ago, uh, that's why, I, for me, I don't know why it is for everybody else, but for years I've had a special place in my heart for the UNIA. And that's why when the gentleman on the end stood up, the head of the UNIA here, and Philadelphia especially, the Philadelphia UNIA, knowing what had happened at the time of God, which was anyway Henry Musco, where they went back, Garvey went back. And then establish a method out of having gone back. Garvey did something else. And so I brought this along just to share with you. And then I'll conclude by telling you what we tell our children. Garvey, in a book by Robert Hill, Marcus Garvey Life and Method. Some of you know there's almost 30,000 documents that have been saved and now published on Marcus Garvey's moon. They quiet? Oh, yeah. Marcus Garvey's documents, in most cases, were found in the files of the FBI and the British Secret Service. Otherwise, a lot of things that he said we wouldn't even know. The snitch kept a record of what he had to say. 
We got 30,000 documents. Now combing through those documents, independent of how they were taken and recorded, you know, and this is before cell phones and tape recorders, so somebody had to be doing a whole lot of shorthand to keep up with what Garvey was trying to say and do. But one of the things Garvey did that many black people don't know about, we know about the ships and all of that, we know about the nurses, we know about the millions of people that marched, uh, we know about the UNIA all over the world. We know about the fact that even in South Africa, Nelson Mandela's uh, uh, group uh, was inspired by the Garvey. The, the, the ANC was originally a Garvey cell mm -hmm. in South Africa. Mm -hmm. So that Garvey was uh, present all over the place. But mm -hmm. what we don't know is he was also an educator. And many of us don't know that he had a school of African philosophy and don't know that he gave uh, wise instructions about how to teach children, how to teach teachers, and that many people in the Garvey movement went to the UNIA University. And there are graduates of them now that still carry the torch in the same way that the president of that association did when he stood here with the same resolve that he had from the very beginning of time. He doesn't need a beginning of the because he was never off base in the ooh, first place. Ooh. Here's what Garvey said in Life and Lesson. And this is part of his teaching. Think about it for a moment. Because we're going to have to take hold of the schooling and socialization process for our children and put that. If that were only a priority, we could do more of it. But we haven't said to ourselves that that's what we have to do. We're yeah. still trying to find a way to work through institutions that are designed by people who do not respect us and have not had our interest at heart. And then on the basis of that, we say that what we need is equity in illegitimate institutions. Thank Woo! you. Right. Here's what God has said. You must never stop learning. Mm. One must never stop reading. Mm. Everything you can of standard knowledge, the best poets, and history until you master it. Master the language of your country. Never write or speak on a subject that you know nothing about. You should read at least four times a day. Wow. Never keep the constant company of anybody who doesn't know as much as you or isn't as educated as you and from whom you cannot learn something or reciprocate in your learning. Never go down in intelligence to those who are below you, but if possible, lift them up to you and always try to ascend to those who are above you and, and, and be their equal in the hope that you will at some point gain mastery. In your desire to accomplish greatness, greatness you must first decide in your own mind in what direction you seek that greatness. And when you have decided in your own mind, then you work unceasingly toward that goal. Never Try never to repeat yourself in any one discourse, saying the same thing over and over, except you're making new points because repetition is tiresome and it annoys those who hear the repetition. No one is ever too old to learn, therefore you should take advantage of every educational facility. Anything that you're going to challenge, you must first know about it so as to be able to defeat it, and knowledge is power. Never, therefore, attempt anything without being able to protect yourself in it. All the knowledge you want is in the world, and all that you have to do is go seeking it, and never stop until you found it. Always have a well-equipped shelf of books. In reading, it is not necessary or compulsory that you agree with everything you read. Pass judgment on what you Read based on these facts. You must always search to find the latest facts on a particular subject, and only when those facts are consistently maintained in what you read should you agree with them. Otherwise, you're entitled to your own opinion. Mm. Always have up-to-date knowledge. Use every spare minute in reading. Never lend anybody the book you want. Mm. Never allow anybody to go to your bookshelf in your absence. If you have a library of your own, lock it when you're not at home. Spend most of your spare time in your library. Read a chapter from the Bible every day. Read and study through poems.
from the hit poem, the tragedy of white injustice, and apply the sentiment. Read with observation, never read carelessly and recklessly. In reading books written by white authors of whatever kind, be aware of the fact that they are not written for your particular benefit or for the benefit of your race. They always write from their own point of view and only in the interest of their own race. Never swallow wholly what the white man writes or says without first critically analyzing it and investigating it. The white man's trick is to deceive other people for his own benefit and power. Woo. Always be on your guard against him with whatsoever he says or does. Never take chances with him. His school books and the elementary schools and high schools and the colleges and universities all fixed up to suit his own purposes and to put him on top and keep him on top of other people. Don't trust him. Beware. Beware. Mm -hmm. Never yield to any statement or history made by any individual caring or not, caring not how great that the Negro was nobody in history. Even if you can't prove it always, claim that the Negro was great. Read mm -hmm. everything that you can get written by Negroes and their ancestors and go back 6,000 years. Never admit that Jesus Christ was a white man. Otherwise, he could not be the son of God and a God to redeem all mankind. When through reading and research you have discovered any new fact helpful to the dignity and prestige and character and accomplishments of the Negro, always make noise about it. That's some of garbage advice. That one volume, Life and Lessons, which also describes the curriculum of the fundamental school of African philosophy is well worth one of the one of the things that we ought to revisit. What should we tell our children? Mm. What we have to tell our children is about the cycles. Mm -hmm. The cycles that we've been to. We have to tell them that what is natural in any human group is to be whole is to be whole means to be in my eye. It means to be in balance and harmony as a family, as an ethnic family, as well as a nuclear family. That's to be whole. That's part of what's natural. That's normal. That's how all people are when they're not faced by trouble. To tell them that they are divine. To tell them that they are creative to tell them that they're connected and that they can be conscious and must be, and to tell them that they must develop character and to keep them informed. But how do you tell them? Irit maha. You tell children things by doing what it is you want them to know. Yes, yes. You cannot get them to learn anything, sending them to somebody else, hoping that they will fix your children for them. Thank you. That's the first thing I want to know. That's what I mean by wholeness, those things that I was talking about there. There was a time before the trouble when we were whole. We can find it in the text. We can find what people were striving for in the text. And you've heard that mentioned. And then the trouble. Tell them about trouble. Tell them about how trouble works. What happens to the family in trouble? What happens to the environment in trouble? What do politicians do to make trouble? Mm -hmm. At a certain point I've written a, a, a summary mm -hmm. of the structure of domination. There's seven facets to it. One of them is to make sure people have no memory. Mm -hmm. As yes. a people. No collective Yes. That's true and real. Mm -hmm. Another is to make sure that people have no collective identity. Mm -hmm. They can have individual identity, not a collective identity. Another is to teach <laughs> okay. the people the superiority of the oppressor mm -hmm. over themselves, okay. culturally and intellectually and every other way. Another is to make sure you control the socialization process of the people you want to dominate. Ooh, why yeah. else would you destroy all the meta nature and make us wait hundreds of years before somebody could painstakingly put it back together again so we could read the remnants of what it left, what was left that you hadn't already burned up? Right. 
Why would you shut down the African schools that came into being out of slavery when they were better than the one that you funded for them after that? Why would you do that? Why do the people who run African schools now that have the highest achievement in that district get fired? Like Audrey Bullard in Kansas City. Like Fred Rivers in Lansing, Michigan. Um, why is it that the people who are national champions in forensics are treated like dirt by the principal and the school board, like Tommy Lindsay in Logan High School in the Bay Area in California, got the MacArthur Genius Award, and his principal asked him, what makes people think you're a genius? And he said, because I never thought to ask you that question. <laughs> What do we tell our children? We tell our children what recovery looks like. We have recovered. The Garvey movement was recovery until it was sabotaged. You know, Garvey had painted a new picture of possibility. He had mobilized energies and created structures that were effective, engaged people and time on task, and even now has left a lasting legacy because people are still running around running off the energy that was created during that one movement. That was recovery. Many of our children don't know what recovery looks like. Mm -hmm. The movies haven't been made about God. The movies haven't been made about Haiti. Tucson Low Overture, Book Mons, right. Pocket Movies haven't been made about them yet. Especially the movie from the African perspective that will say what went on there. How did they mobilize in time of trouble and overthrow trouble mm -hmm. and establish my eye again for themselves? It's happened before. It's happened many times. Mm -hmm. But if our children don't know that, then we will not have informed them wisely. And then our children must be told that their essence ultimately is spiritual. Yes, yes, that yes. That they are spirit. Yes. We live in a world which is telling them in every way that they are material and that they must crave materialism, that they are hogs for power and they must crave to be hoggish and powerful over other people. Mm -hmm. That is not, that's the value of the African world history project. When we go back and uncover the septepe for African people, when we read those texts, Patao Chap is not talking about, doesn't sound like Machiavelli at all. And every time Africans confront Machiavelli, they put him down. That's what uh, the president of the University of Sacre, uh, our people did in uh, looking at Machiavelli in Sacre. They looked at it and criticized Machiavelli. One of the books that uh, Ahmed Bible was supposed to have written was a critique of uh, the prince. Matthew Bell is the prince. That's what they said. I would, I would love to know what that would look like because I'm sure it would be a critique from the point of view of my eye. In other words, when we go back to wholeness, then we have an image that we could tell to our children so that they would know what to strive for should they be freed and uh, liberated enough to make some choices for themselves and for their children. But in order to do that, as I said, what you say is not what they will see. There is something, as I conclude, called mirror neuron. Anyone ever heard of it? If you want, when you email me for anything that you ask me for, ask me for that PowerPoint I've got on mirror neuron. That's a new thing in, in um, uh, neurology and learning. And what, what they've discovered from watching apes in laboratory, imitate the behavior of the lab assistants who didn't even know they were observed. And the only way they knew the ape was even watching was by electrodes hooked up to the ape brain. Because the ape is just sitting there, not doing anything. But down the road, the ape begins to imitate the behavior, picking up the cup and taking a drink, like the person did that they watched. Because they said the apes have something called mirror neurons. That you have pictures in your head 
of what took place outside, and you don't have to do anything except have your eyes open. And then they went further than that and started examining human beings. And they found out that human beings have even more deep and complicated and massive sets of neural neurons. And the neurons allow you, simply by watching, not only to imitate the behavior like dance and playing ball and things like that, but also to take in the intent of people and the emotional state and to experience that as if it were you. Just by observing. This, 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 is some, this is some new stuff, extremely powerful stuff. Yes, yes. But it's something you already know anyway. That's what Sunichi Suzuki learned in teaching the violin. His method, get the book Nurtured by Love. And in that book, he said, the way you teach anybody, get rid of your little spider nose know, gifted kids. I don't want them. If you think they're gifted, you go teach them yourself. Get me the ones that nobody thinks can learn. That's what Sunichi
He changed his name from Sterling, which was the name of the plantation owner, to Bunker Hilliard after the Battle of Bunker Hill. So he thought that would be a liberation name. He picked up his family in a covered wagon and went all the way to Texas, where he settled down with his 13 children, including his oldest son, who was named Asa. And Asa got into a little trouble in Hackberry, Texas, where they settled. You get a white man in the head and had to leave. <laughs> 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 So I guess if that hadn't happened, I wouldn't have been born because he wouldn't have been in Bay City where my mother was, uh, where, my, where his son was born. Uh, his son is Asa the second who followed him as a high school principal. Asa became the principal of Booker T. Washington High School and did such a good job. They, when he died, they changed the name of the high school to A.G. E. Hilliard High School. They liked his work so much that my father, who was a senior at Prairie View at the time, was asked to leave school before graduation to come and take his father's place in that high school, which he did. And he stayed there for 17 years. So that I grew up in Bay City and Van Fleck and Houston and Marlin for the first 12 years of my life which is very important to me, and you'll see why in a moment. Before leaving and going to Denver with my mother, who is also an independent spirit, and I might as well tell her side of the story too, because I'm on there. Because they too had a uh, really important experience. One of the greatest love stories I've ever heard, her great-grandfather was Jim Shanko, who was on a plantation in Mississippi, and he left Mississippi because his wife had been sold to a family in Texas. And one night he ran away from the plantation with a friend, headed to Texas to try to find his wife. And they got to a lot of places, a long story, but I won't make it as long as my grandmother makes it when she tells me. <laughs> But they, they were helped along the way by women who would feed them at these different plantations where they would stop. And they got to the Mississippi River, and the bridges were all covered, so they had to swim. And my grandfather found out at the last minute that his friend couldn't swim. And so they went into the middle of the Mississippi River up to their chest, and they found out it was too deep. And they hugged. My grandfather said he had to find his wife, so he swam the Mississippi River and walked 400 miles barefoot until he found his wife and founded a town in Texas today called Shankleville, Texas. There's today a Texas historical marker that marks this spot where Jim and Winnie, Winnie came out to get water one evening and Jim was in the bushes. And he whispered to her and they were reunited. Uh, these are some of the kinds of stories that our family told us, and I know that many families can tell these stories. It's unfortunate that we have to save these stories and dramatize these stories and made them the subject of the movies when we get a chance behind the camera. We make every other kind of movie, but we don't seem to make those movies. But what I need to tell you is that after my mother and dad got together, what I'm used to is an excellent education environment. And I think most of us were. You see, I didn't have a white teacher until I was 12 years old. But I had excellent education. I remember as a little boy, the first song the earliest song that I can remember as a little boy was from a visit that I made to the high school where my dad was principal and would lift every voice and sing. 
And after we moved to Denver, they didn't sing that song anymore, but it was always in my head, and I kept trying to remember it. And I can remember the day when somebody sang it again, and I caught the tune to lift every voice and sing. And I'm just happy that uh, we finally picked that one instead of the other one for the song that we sing each time. But again, I remember that environment as a little eight-year-old boy standing in a high school. And I remember those tall children standing there singing this song lustily at the tops of their voices. And it would bring tears to my eyes. I remember the teacher asked me as I was in that room a question. She sat me on the front row. She said, Mr. Hillier, I don't know if you know Southern School, but they would call you Mr. Mr. Hillier, you know I was eight years old. What is a preposition? I don't know what I said, but she pretended that I had actually given the right answer to the question. And I remember the feeling of warmth, both for the question and also for the reception of my answer in this excellent school. But by the way, this school, even though it was closed for integration, I call it disintegration, because it disintegrated the African community. Right. And that school is now closed, but every year they have an alumni meeting, and they'll have four, five hundred people still going to a school that's been closed for their alumni meeting. Lawyers, doctors, bankers coming from all over the world back to Bay City because they had an excellent education in the African community. All we wanted, if you remember at that time, people weren't asking for integration, they were asking for their money. That's what they said. They wanted their money. They said, we won't give you the money, we'll give you a chance to move out of your community and sit with somebody else in another community. In which you get resegregated in an integrated environment. But that wasn't the case then. We were well integrated among African people in a segregated environment. I remember going to school in Marlin, Texas, and I remember virtually all my teachers. I remember being received with love and unconditional regard in the public schools of Marlin, Texas. I remember being sent to prayer review in junior declamation, having an opportunity to go up and get in a speech contest that I almost won, but a little sister just beat the stew out of me. She won first place, I got second place. But I remember, again, as a nine-year-old being on, tech, on the campus of Prairie View University, you can imagine being able to see what the future looks like. That's what that visit meant. It wasn't so much making a speech, but I could see what right minds in the African community were accomplishing. And I could see the social life and the reinforcement. Then I could remember my father as a high school principal. After he left Texas and went to Cairo, he had a pattern. I just want to show you how you select teachers and compare it to how people select teachers today. My dad would get in a car when he thought that he heard about a good teacher. He would get in a car loaded up with gas at his own expense, drive halfway across the state of Texas, spend three or four days in the town talking to everybody who knew this potential teacher to find out whether this was really the right person, visit that person in class, and then if he thought that person was all right, they might get a job and end up got high school. That's why they became one of the top high schools in the state of Texas. They had the best band, best football team, and above all, the best academics. You couldn't drop out because my dad wouldn't permit it. Had a young man tried to drop out, Herman Wilson. Herman Wilson told my father he was dropping out of school. Dad said, you're not dropping out. He said, what's your reason? Herman Wilson said, well, my reason is that uh, my grandmother had been taking care of me because my mother died. He said, and now my grandmother is sick and I must take care of her, so I have a higher responsibility. They mobilized the African community and they provided for his grandmother and put the boy 
going back and do it. <laughs> Herman Wilson went to Lincoln University and graduated at the top of his class. Then he went to Harvard Law School and graduated number one in his Harvard Law School class. Because you can't drop out in an excellent school. There are a lot of schools around that can't live up to those standards today. And as a matter of fact, when I go into the colleges of teacher education, where they talk about what an excellent school is, they don't talk about the advocacy role of principals, the love that's supposed to be manifest, the social environment that's supposed to provide opportunities for students to reinforce and get to know each other. It's a different language altogether. We had expectations in our excellent school. We had demands that people made on us in our excellent school. We had available teachers always in my community. My teachers lived next door across the street, around the corner. They were in the church. So we, we, they were available to us. They were not aliens. And we had familiar educators, principals. When those schools were closed, by the way, they were closed in Texas. When my dad retired, there were over 500 African principals in Texas. Within a very short period of time, the cost of immigration it had dropped down to five. Now, what did those communities lose? They didn't just lose a school administrator, because all those principals had other functions that they served as role models in a community and community building. You're looking for the seeds of some of the problems that we have in education right now. You can go right back to that period. I was back in my hometown not long ago in Bay City, Texas. And I sat next to the superintendent of the school. And he asked me if I could come down and consult with him on how to teach at-risk students. And I wanted to know who he meant. Because that's my hometown, and when my father was principal, there were no at-risk students. There was only African students that were there. But now they become at-risk. They're on dope, on drugs, in gangs. But they have higher qualified faculty, more degrees, more certificates from better universities. And they've gone from excellent schools to terrible schools in a short period of time. When I went to Denver, out of the Texas community at the age of 12, we had another kind of solution to this problem. I'm still talking about excellence in the African community. Excellent education in the African community is a way of setting up this problem that I want to talk about. There are certain names that pop out in my own experience. A lady named Sister Ruby, who worked in the Church of God in Christ. At that time, I was in the Church of God in Christ, sanctified church. Sister Ruby was the one that took everybody's children in the church and out of the church. And every Sunday, every Saturday, every night, she would have two, three hundred kids that she was doing something with. You ought to see her walk down the street managing two hundred children other people's children. But what we knew is we had unconditional love from Sister Ruth. We had excellence in education in the African community. I wish I could tell you what happened to the children who were in Sister Ruby's group. We had Mr. Porter, who was a Boy Scout leader. Almost anybody who was anybody in Denver had to go in Boy Scouts, but you weren't in Boy Scouts. That didn't mean anything. What it meant was you got a chance to be with a little man four feet tall that never cracked a smile and never raised his voice and never had a discipline problem. That was Mr. Porter. I had an excellent, I'm surrounded by all of this excellence that I can't find now. We had Mr. Mosley, who was one of the Tuskegee Airmen. Every Saturday, 
Two, three hundred boys go down to the YMCA and hear stories of the fighting 99 and learn the song of the black pilot who had that incredible record over in Europe as they escorted bombers and never lost a bomber, an unequal record in aviation history in the military. Then we had Miss Smith, who did something called the show wagon. And we had in Denver, of all places, in the 40s, an African dance troupe. And my wife was an African dancer, and I was an African drummer. So that Miss Smith was the one that turned my African curiosity into a love of things African. And then, of course, there was Miss Wolfhawk, a little old, gnarled lady about 80 years old, who saw me when I was getting ready to drop out of school myself in a new and hostile and alien environment. Graduated from school with no prospect of going to school because I didn't have money. She was the one who went down to a foundation and made them change their policies in giving scholarships. She said, you've never given a black person a scholarship the whole time you've been doing it, and here's somebody that's deserving. And she forced them with her own sit-in of one to do that. Those are the kind of people that I have. In the I was surrounded as were my peers. I'm not the only beneficiary of their love and encouragement. I was surrounded by people that Gloria Latin Villain in a wonderful new book that she just written called The Dream Keepers. She called them the Dream Keepers. That's what they were. Now, we didn't only have excellent education when Africans were more in charge of their communities. We come from a long, excellent tradition in African education. This is the first point I want to make. Because many of the teachers that I see who are African don't know this. Right. You know the Europeans don't know. Right. But the Africans also don't know that we did not come here as educational beggars. Right. That when Africans came here during the enslavement period, that what we left behind was better than anything else on earth to the world of Africans. Go into any of the valleys. Dr. Clark is always talking about trying to understand Africa by understanding. If you don't understand the rivers, then you don't understand the valleys. That's why I like to do to write that poem, I've Known Rivers. Because it's on the rivers that people create their civilization. And if you look for the evidence of what the Africans did in education, you'll go to the river. You go to the River Nile, and you will find at least three major centers of higher education on the Nile before Europe ever existed. Right. In the country of Kemet, in the country of Nubia, and also in the country, country of uh, the area of Ethiopia, or what we call Kush. In those areas, we had at least three major places where independent African excellence higher education, high tech high spiritual education existed, providing the model for the world. So we don't have to come as beggars in the design of excellent education. We come to this with a background of high achievement. Or go to the other river, in the Niger. It is the Niger that starts out in the west of Africa and goes up and touches the Sahara, and where it touches the Sahara, it turns around and says, no, no, and back through the forest and down into the Atlantic River. But at that point where the trees and the desert meet, sits the city of Timbuktu. And around that river, three to four major cities produce higher education, high-tech, excellent education. Gen A, Gao, Timbuktu. And they tell me now that Gao had a better reputation than Timbuktu and the University of San Ray, which is considerable. And we begin now to look at what was going on there because people have always tried to depress the meaning of those river universities, mainly because they existed at the height of the slave trade, at the very time that they were taking Africans and turning them into Negroes. 
and calling them savages, these Africans had existing in the same place where they were getting it from, these incredible higher education institutes. Dr. Obinga just put out a book called The Lost Tradition in African Philosophy. And in that book, he gives a list of the books that were written by Ahmed Baba that still exist. I was amazed to find out that Ahmed Baba, the president of the University of Sangore in Timbuktu, had written books on many topics, not just one topic. He wrote on law, he wrote on theology, he wrote on philosophy, he wrote on grammar, he wrote on literature. This is a man who's president of the university around the 1600s now, right? Remember slavery starting in the 1400s, 1492, when Columbus sailed in the ocean and blew. And it's even pre-colonial, but it's in the height of the slave period. We have these African institutions of great, so great that when they closed the University of Sangare, they didn't destroy the faculty, but they hired them in Morocco and forced them to teach, including Ahmed Baba. Why? Because they had a better faculty in inner Africa than they had on the north coast up there close to Europe. Because we have an excellent tradition in African education. History tells us that the people from Mali came here as slaves and in this country. Many of them spoke Arabic and could write the Quran from memory and did it. One brother was so bad that the slave owner tried to get him to uh, write the Lord's Prayer in that language that you write. He didn't know what he was writing, so the slave owner was illiterate in both English and Arabic. <laughs> he said, just write the Lord's Prayer for me because I needed it for something. So he wrote it. Long after he had died, as they translated what the brother wrote, he wrote it. Second surah of the Quran. I told him it was the Lord's prayer. <laughs> I'm just saying that uh, we didn't come here begging, and we don't have to. We don't have to make up stories. These stories are well recorded on what we can do. And right now, we still have an operation, as you well know, in the Nile Valley or in the Niger Valley. That same area around which Timbuktu exists, and this we need to keep in mind. We had Africans who didn't join either Islam or Christianity, the Dogon, and they're still running natural African universities at this moment. And these are high-tech institutions that know not only something about the natural world, but they know about the physical development of human beings and the mental and the spiritual development of human beings something that never existed in the West, the spirit in particular. I'm saying that because there's an image of who Africans were in the minds of many Europeans, most Europeans. That doesn't bother me, never has. The problem is that Africans adopt the European images of who the Africans were. And the minute you do that, you are now vulnerable to someone who comes along and tells you know how to educate you. And that's what happened. As we began to get our degrees and our certificates in psychology and sociology and anthropology and pedagogy, what we attempt to do is meet the standard. What good does it do to meet a standard? when that standard doesn't measure up to the lowest level of African education. <laughs> Why do I say that? You'll be waiting for the book by Brother Over the Shop that it will be coming out soon. One of the most important books that the shop or anyone else has written, in my opinion, one of the first books to articulate African pedagogy. What were the methods by which the Africans educated themselves? What were the aims by which the Africans operated? And of course, the Dogon again give us deep insight into this. You remember they have this Giri soul, the Beni so Bolo soul, and so Dai levels of education. Giri so being the first word with the things that they appear to be. It does take it for about 15 years to get there, to get to that degree. 
the Geary So degree. You had two white people that were given a Geary So degree. They wrote a book called Conversations with Olo Jimenez. And they wrote a book called The Pale Fox. That's Griol and Derrick. And they say they got Geary So. But they didn't get Benny So. And they put the word on the side. And the word from behind, which is Bolo So. And they never got So Dai, which is the clear word. That takes about 60 to 70 years to get the clear word. <laughs> okay, this is Africans now. Why did they not get the clear word? Because they never had a spiritual education. They had a natural education, but they never had a spiritual education. The Africans understand spirituality. And as Marimba Ivy has shown us in the book Yoruba, what's missing from Western civilization is capitalism or communism. Because both are based on materialism and spiritualism. There is no spirit. And if you don't have a spirit, people can't be whole. We are not only material, we are material and spiritual. So we come from an excellent tradition in which we have an idea of the aim of education, the methods of education. And we know what ought to be in the content of education. If you get into Nile Valley, what became the liberal arts tradition in the West was pulled from an incomplete understanding of that same tradition in the Nile Valley. The Nile Valley had 10 virtues as the purpose of education. The Greeks took it, decided they could get along with four of them. Six virtues they didn't need. The Nile Valley had seven subjects in the liberal arts curriculum. The Greeks decided they only needed three of them. And the Romans had to add the four a little bit later on. I'm just saying they were partial fulfillment students. That's what they were. But we need to know what the whole system, not just the Nile Valley, but all those systems of African education look like. And so brothers like Owen Tashaka, who have spent, for example, he spent the last 15 years studying Dogon education and the Pale Fox in particular. And more recently, when he wrote his book on Return to the African Mother Principle, that is based on the examination of male-female relationships and family relationships in 13 African societies. In other words, what he is doing is answering questions about development and education by asking Africans the answers to those questions. Where else would you go to find the answer to the question when people have never answered those questions for themselves? And we had an answer to those questions before. I'm saying that if you had this knowledge and this information, then you would not be able to be confused by people who don't have the knowledge and information. You would not be vulnerable to trash. Even after we left Africa, we kept creating excellent schools. We did it here. We had schools before the slavery period ended. Go back into the early 1800s. Carter Woodson in the book, The Education of the Negro, that's before the Civil War. If you find out that Africans, every time they got a chance, they tried to organize a school because they understood that close to the Mahapa. They understood that ultimately, if you don't control the education process, you will never be a free person. We've forgotten that. We've forgotten that. We think that we can get freedom by access to what other people call a good education. We don't have to hold our heads down to anybody because we know what good schools are like, and we created them as fast as we could. We created the African Free School right here in New York City. Look at who went to the African Free School here in New York City, and look at what the graduates did, and see the impact that they had on African people. It's very clear. They created black colleges and universities in order to keep us enslaved. Reasonable Pan-Africanism in Education by Kenneth King. The purpose of black colleges was not to give us liberation. It was to contain the brightest and the best of us. The philanthropists were the ones who set the curriculum for these schools. They sent their man down here, Thomas Jesse Jones. Thomas Jesse Jones was sent to work at Hampton University. He was a Welshman. After he worked at 
Hampton University for a while, they saw W.E.B. Du Bois was having too much influence on the minds of his people, so they sent Thomas Jesse Jones out to imitate Du Bois. Du Bois was doing studies on the black family. Thomas Jesse Jones did a study on the black family. But he became the expert, not Du Bois. Based on that, Booker T was asked by his boss, Samuel Chapman Armstrong, who founded Hampton, who also was the one that said, let your fucking die where you are, not Booker T. That was his suit. And he sent Booker T to Tuskegee to set up a school like him, called Tuskegee Institute. And then, when Thomas Jesse Jones asked Booker T, he said, look, what I need you to do as a black person is to ask for something to fill your need, which I will tell you what it is. That sound familiar? Yeah. So Booker T did what Thomas Jesse Jones did. He asked or what uh, Samuel Chapman Armstrong asked for, the president had asked for, and he invited Thomas Jesse Jones to do a study of independent black education. Why? Because they began to get these African immersion schools that were created by African people. They had independent schools. So they decided that if you're going to have independent schools, maybe they need to be accredited in some way. So Jesse Jones was an unofficial accrediting agency, and based on the study that he did of independent African education, he concluded that not one school measured up the standard, and they closed all of them and made the rule that Africans could have a school as long as they had a white board of trustees. That's time of Jesse Jones. Now because he did this, because he had done these studies, he became the expert on black people. And by being expert on black people, he worked for the Felt Stokes Fund. The Felt Stokes Fund is a philanthropic organization at this time. And as his job in the Felt Stokes Fund was to oversee African education. Not just African Americans. They knew that Africans on the continent and Africans here were the same people, so Jesse was in charge of all of those. He was, how did he get to be in charge? He got to be in charge because by being an expert on Africans, any foundation that had money would have to come to him for a recommendation about whether to give it to a black college or not. If, they, if he said, yes, give it to a black college, they would do it. If he said, no, they wouldn't. Well, what would be the conditions that would make him give money to a black college? An amenable black president. So you had, so he literally could handpick presidents of the black colleges here and in Africa. He had a committee that he served on. This committee uh, included a South African named C.T. Lorraine and a Britisher named E.K. Oldham. That was a board of education for black higher education worldwide. And they ran the show and made all the decisions about college presidents, the college curriculum. They made not only those decisions, they made decisions about the YMCA. Who could serve as a YMCA director in Africa? They made those decisions. They didn't want certain types getting over there and serving up the Africans. And then they decided which Africans could come to school and go to school in the United States. And then after they decided that, they decided which book should go in their book bag as they got oriented to education in the United States. I'm trying to show you the deliberate, calculated design of a mishire education for African people. This is what it was intended to be. Now, the fact that many of what I'm trying to say is that in spite of all of that, African creativity comes through. And so some people, not all, were able to overcome all of that, and in spite of that, Turn that whole situation around. That's what Dubois was trying to get. He said, I don't mind vocational education, but I got to have some head as well as some heart education. You got to have both. You don't have just one. If there's no one sitting down trying to understand this historical perspective that I'm trying to talk about right now, then we're going to be vulnerable again. Because it was clear to him and everybody else. It was clear to them that the people who were giving money had no intention of seeing us free. You know that they met at Capon Springs, a group of white philanthropists to design the education of Africans after slavery. 
That's what they did. Lake Mohawk. They went up there and they met in private to design the education of African people. They were determined that African people would never get the mental independence, especially through higher education. That's why it was targeted at higher education. They closed all the black medical schools. Abraham Spencer closed a whole bunch of schools. You have to study on medical education. You've got to go back and you've got to get some of this history. Good book for you is Anderson's book on the history of Negro education. It's an excellent book because it summarizes many of the things that I'm talking about. But always need the companion to that Pan Africanism and Education by Kenneth King. So, in spite of that, we turn out excellent school. If they let us alone, we can fix it. Come on. We didn't leave excellence in Africa. We brought excellence with us and we got excellence now. That's why there's a man at Clark Atlanta University named Abdullah Lim Shabazz. Right. Abdullah Lim Shabazz. Right. Many years ago, for six years at Clark Atlanta University, started working with folks. Took students on an open enrollment basis, had the one item admission test to get into the math program. No SAT, no ACT. Do you want to learn math? Your answer is yes, you're admitted. Yes! You're admitted. You're admitted. You say, well, doesn't that lower standard? Well, let's look at the record. Who is it that has produced all of the black PhDs in mathematics in America? Shabazz did half of them. There's 200 of them, and over 100 of them were produced by Abdullah bin Shabazz and his students. In a six year period, he outperformed the whole nation. Now, would you say that's low standards or high standards? <laughs> they didn't get their PhD from Clark Atlanta University. They didn't have a program. Still don't have a program. They had to go to Harvard and Yale and Princeton and compete with the best minds on the earth. And guess what they did? Successfully. I was at the Academy of Sciences when the awards were given out for the greatest math teachers in America. There were 30 awards given out that night. 15 of those awards went to Shabazz and his students. You're talking about excellent education. We don't need to beg anybody to tell us about how to educate our children. I just left Los Angeles talking to Dr. Andre and Tom. I hope you get a chance to see the video that you have it. Of these little children at Marcus Garden School. Because people don't believe they exist. You tell stories like I'm trying to tell right now, people don't believe it. You got to see it in order to believe it. Last February, television believed it because they went out with four television stations to film these Africans in the Marcus Garden School in Los Angeles. We have a two hour tape of these little children. Little three year olds that know their alphabet in English, Swahili, and Spanish. Starting their algebra in preschool, every fifth grader takes and passes calculus. I'm talking about serious academic work. It seems to me that somebody else, if you don't know how to do that, since this is the same people who are failing in the public school, and if you don't know how to do it, you have to ask somebody who knows how to do it. Who do we ask? We ask the very people who put the kids in the shape that they're in right now. So we have an excellent tradition. I don't care where you go. If you leave us alone, we'll make it. Go to Xavier University right now. They have an open admissions program because over a third of the students can't even make the admissions requirement. But 50% of the students at Xavier major in math and science. 20% of the math and science majors get doctoral and dental degrees. Go down to Tougaloo College in Mississippi. Tougaloo College, almost an open enrollment institution, but Tougaloo College is the source of all the black lawyers in Mississippi. 40% of the black lawyers in Mississippi come out of Tougaloo College. Tougaloo don't have a law school. They got to come out of Tougaloo, go to the University of Mississippi Law School and kick Matthew behind and they do it. 
we understand something about the education process. I'm, I'm worried to say, well, why are you saying all this? I'm saying all of this because we don't act as if this is our tradition. We act shame of what it is that we have to achieve. We act like we don't know anything and that we're people who are needing help. All right. And that has to change. All right. We have always known how to meet the mainstream standards. So that's all I've been talking about so far. But there are some African standards that are not in the mainstream. It's one thing to be able to get your PhD in mathematics. We've been doing that all along. There's so many people doing it. In fact, brothers can do stuff without PhD. You think, <laughs> I told the sister this, and Kim, we were just over there in uh, July. So I told the story of Vivian Thomas. I don't know if y'all know the story of brother at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, this brother was a lab assistant when he was over in Tennessee at Vanderbilt University. Lab assistant to this doctor. Dr. Blaylock is his name, a famous heart surgeon. And this brother did not have a medical degree. But he began to study dogs. <laughs> and he began to do heart transplants on dogs. And he did 500, 600 dogs until he got good at doing his heart surgery. And the brother followed Blaylock to Johns Hopkins University at his lab or so. Got to let Johns Hopkins University continue to do his work. Then he began to coach the elite of the medical profession in heart surgery right. and invented the blue baby operation right. Right. for heart surgery to cure the blue baby defect in baby. His boss didn't invent it, he invented it. Then taught his boss how to do the surgery. No degree. But wait, his boss did what doctors do when you invent surgery, surgical technique. He went to demonstrate that surgical technique. You know how you have a whole uh, auditorium of doctors and TV cameras as you show the world how to perform this technique of which you are the master. But there's a problem if you're not really the master. Because when you get into the said into the Red Sea, that's when they cut the chest open. You start cutting around in there, and Blaylock got lost. Had to turn around in the middle of the operation, call Vivian Thomas out of the audience and say, come down here, sit right here, tell me what to do. Here's a brother with no degree to training heart surgery. Not just Blaylock, Cooley, all the surgeons that came through John Hopkins Medical Center, this brother with no degree, <laughs> he had a part of their education. Now, last year, John Hopkins finally got around to giving him an honorary medical degree <laughs> for all the work that he had done. So I told this study to a sister who works for some heart surgeons, and they said that's not true because she's a nurse, lab assistant. They said, that's not true, because it sounds like you were saying, maybe I can do some of this hard surgery. They said, no, we can teach you how to do all the cutting that we do, but we got another body of information over here you don't know nothing about. You don't know nothing about medication. You don't know anything about anesthetics. You don't know. See that? So we know all of this. That's what separates you from us. I ain't going for it. I ain't going for it. I'm just saying, we know excellent education. If someone wants to know how to teach children, our or theirs, they got to ask African people if they want to ask for the best model. Right. We would want to nurture the best of the European family. That's what they call to do the birth rate. It wasn't just because we were cheap, but because Africans knew something about mothering that other people apparently did not know and now have forgotten. So we have to redefine excellence before we can look at what the problem is. Excellence in this African definition. For example, when I asked Shabazz, what is it that you're doing? What he told me, he said, hey, what I do. I was expecting, you know, some kind of method. I use uh, cooperative learning. I use, uh, you know, test, retest, teach, and test. I'm looking for some kind of mechanical method. 
He limited himself to a higher plane. He said, no way. He said, what I do to students, I don't care what their preparation is. I teach to their intellect. That's how I teach math. I appeal to their intellect. I don't appeal to them to do a little drill and practice there. How, how can you appeal to somebody's intellect if you think they don't have it? How many people think Africans have intellect? See? Most folks don't think we have intellect. I'll be back up here Saturday morning, I'm sorry, Sunday morning at the American Psychological Association to deal with the bell curve. Because that's the book that's out there to talk about the fact we don't have the intellect. We're going to see who has the intellect. <laughs> Teach to the intellect. He said, hey, that's not all. You not only have to teach to the African intellect if you want them to be these great scientists. He said, it's not that they have a PhD in math. He said, but my people, they live math because math is it's the world. And the world is natural. It's mathematics. Math is the world, it's nature, and nature is mathematics. He said, so when you study mathematics, you're studying the whole world. That's what you're doing. That's what I tell you. To the end of, he said, but then I appeal to their humanity. How can you appeal to a student's humanity if you don't think they have any? If you're calling them dogs and animals and, and, uh, and criminals and, and felons and so forth, how can you teach somebody when you don't think that they're human? And then he said, I teach to the spirit. How can you teach to the spirit when you don't teach to your own spirit? I'm talking about the African idea of what an excellent school is. We still got it, and we all these 400 years into the Mahabha, and we still got an understanding of it. The African also knows that in an African school, part of what you're supposed to do is what my dad did. You're supposed to belong to your students. I used the word yesterday, bond to the students. Wade Noble directed me. He said, no, he said, I think that finally that's got a lot of baggage. He said, why don't you say what it really is is that you belong to the students and they belong to you. That's the, that's the environment that you try to teach. What am I told in the professional arena now? I'm told not to belong to your students. In fact, if I'm in an IQ test, I'm told to detach myself, sit back, shut up, watch, don't have at all, not to get involved. I'm told if I go to school and I get in Los Angeles, come back pay for working with Africa. Extra pay just to be able to be, just to be required to be around African people. That's not a bonded relationship with a student. And then you're supposed to belong to the school. Africans know that. I lived in Africa for six years. I saw how Africans felt about their school. They felt about their school because they had the elders in those schools that were running those schools. They didn't have aliens in the schools running the school. I'm talking about the traditional African school. When they come at night and pull the little boy out of his house, and every other boy in town that's 13 years old come right out of that house with him, and they get taken out of town by the elders to be taught the essential lesson of the African community. Same thing happened to the young women. In Liberia, they call the young men's society, the Poro Society. The young women's society is called the Sandy Society. And Poro and Sandy go out at the same time. And they break up at the same time. And they have this incredible graduation that these kids come out demonstrating what they can do. Because all we see is the dancing and singing and the paint and all the clothing that they have. But what has happened to them is that they have been transformed from base metal into gold. That's what the Africans thought they were doing. Excellent African education means that you're supposed to belong to the community that you serve. You can't be an alien and have the high standards and believe in the humanity and intellect and teach to the spirit. And then, of course, the Africans always knew that they bonded to destiny. The purpose of education was never just to get a job. You go back out to the Dominic education system in the Nile Valley, they say, why are you building? They say, we are building for eternity. Right. That's what we're doing. Right. That's why you can't find Pharaoh's house nowhere. Right. You find the tomb, right. 
you find the temple, where is the house? Because the house was not for eternity. We, the tomb and the temple were for the spirit which lives forever. And that's why they put all their resources, mobilized the whole society, directed its attention on the eternal, imperishable star as the symbol of eternity. Bonding to destiny. And then to create an educational collective. That's what Africans wanted to do. And to communicate and collaborate in the creation of that. And then to create a learning community. I'm describing what I saw. I'm describing what I read about. I'm describing what I have experienced when we are left alone to do what we're supposed to do. Now the only thing that we were asking for was that we should be left alone to do this. And people say, no, that's not what you want. What you want is what we got. <laughs> but what is it that they had? Before I go to that for a moment, let's look at what the student was supposed to do. In African education, the way I studied, I've been looking at this now for 30 years. I ask myself the question, anything that I do, I'm a psychologist. So my question before I do anything is ask the question, did these questions ever occur to African people? How did they answer it? And until I know the answer to that, I'm not going anywhere. Once I know the answer to that, then I can study anything. Then I can find out whether there's any improvement. That's what this chapter is doing. He's asking the question. Did this question of education occur to African people? How do they answer that question? And once we know the answer to that, then we can answer a lot of things. Here's what we're finding. African people first and foremost wanted the students who respected the teachers and the adults in that community. That's part of the result. Right. African people wanted the students who knew things, especially history and culture, as well as math and science. See, a lot of us know things. But just because you got a PhD don't mean anything. The brother who got, I told, I think the last time there, I might have mentioned this young brother from Ghana who has seven patents and five options. Uh, he made two billion dollars for Bell Laboratory and Corny Glass with his invention. By the way, the brother so bright that he made these inventions in his sideline field. That's not his main work. <laughs> seven patents and five options. He's now working for NASA, and he's one of the architects for the information superhighway. We see, that's all well and good, but the question is, what part of this is coming back to you? If you're making billions for everybody else and nothing for yourself, something's out of balance. My life has been destroyed. So you got to know enough to ask that question. It isn't enough to know how to count. you got to know when to count and why you count it. And so Alan has understood. They wanted to develop a student who asked questions. They wanted to, ask, to develop a student who creates and makes things. A student who meditates and reflects. That's why if you look at African society, one of the things you notice is the poverty of this today in popular culture. African society is full all day long. All you hear is wise sayings. That's all you ever hear. People are always giving you some kind of saying. If a problem comes up, you're thought to be a smart person if you can pick exactly the right saying to make things clear. Be genuine while I check these things fall apart. And you will see these wise sayings and how people use them. And so that's something to make the child reflect. You don't just say, stop, don't do that. They are here. Yeah. Make the star behind. Right. <laughs> There's a little reflection that has to go on. <laughs> we want a student who belongs, not one who goes out and comes back to the community so they can show off for the community what they got degree, car, whatever it is, but one who sees the interests of the community as their own. They want a student who acts. Not one who sits down and merely listens and becomes competent, naming you the, 
the, the whole national instructional program at one point was minimum competency. There's more to it than competency, but one who speaks Metro Network. Metro Network is beautiful speech. The interesting thing, that's what the committee people call it. Jake Carruthers has written whole papers about Medu Nefer, beautiful speech. That was the goal, one of the main goals of committee society, was that people would speak beautifully, not just speak clearly, but speak beautifully. You know what was funny? When I was talking to Shabazz about what he does and how he teaches, he said, hey, you know, when I talk to students, I, want, I tell them that math is not an exact science. He tells them exactly the opposite of what everybody else is telling them. I thought that was the one exact science. He said, no, it's trial and error. He said, you try one thing, you try another, and then you get something that you think looks like a rule. He said, that's what I want my students to do. I want them to investigate and to invent. And when they have invented, I want them to write up what they found in a beautiful way. Medu never. The same thing that we find in the committee system still present in the creative system of one of the greatest math teachers on the planet today. We say that we want a student who is clear about their identity. Lead time that's very important because one of the strategies of white supremacy right now is to confuse the African community. Categories in the census called mixed. Right. It's black, white, and mixed. Right. You can be whatever you want to be. Right. And this, is, this identity thing is not something that we really want to do. Why? Because they fully understand what identity means. I got an article that I pulled out of the paper two, two times in the New York Times book review section. I forgot the exact date reference. Anybody wants to get it to you. But on the same day, they showed that they understood the meaning of identity. One of the things they said was that Japan, because of a rise in ethnic consciousness, it would make it difficult or impossible for the United States to impose its control over them anymore. What they said. On the same day in the book review section, they said, with the rise of Islamic fundamentalism, it will make it impossible to work the agenda out in that part of the world. As people began to develop any kind of identity, they began to develop strength because they have unity and trust. All right. All right. The essence of our great teachers and great schools has not changed. It had nothing to do with simple mechanical technique. The best teachers in the African family were always visionaries. That's the teachers I had. September Clark, one of the great teachers of all time, taught in this literacy program in the South, 11 Southern states, and they taught, got almost 11 million people on the road to vote. And many of them had to be taught under trees in the yards of churches, because they prayed to let them have their freedom schools in churches. They wouldn't let them have them in the public schools, so they sat out under trees and taught reading on laundry bags with Crayola as writing instruments. And yet, September Clark was a visionary. When I asked September Clark, what was your method? See, that's my job, is to find out what the method is. That's my professional work. I'm supposed to know that. So when I get a good teacher, I want to know what they do. And I'm always off base, just like I was with the bear. I'm asking for one thing, he's coming over here from another direction. Same thing with September. I thought she was going to tell me I used the look same method. I used findings. I used, she said, she said, in her quiet voice, she says, son, what I do is point to the goal. See, I tell them why they're reading. She says, you are spending time decoding words so that you can read, so that you can read the state constitution of Mississippi, so that you can walk into the polling booth and vote, so that when you vote, you can put a person in there that will liberate you. I point to the goal. That's a vision. That's the kind of teachers that we have. There's nothing on the checklist for teacher preparation that says visionary in the traditional arena. You understand what I'm saying? Our best teachers were parents 
and nurture. Yeah. That's what the teachers that I grew up with saw me as their child. Right. And they treated me like a child, their child. Right. They felt completely empowered that they needed to do what was necessary to make me do what I had to do. Right. And you know the story, all of you who had any of those old times you know that when you got that in school, you really didn't want to go home that evening. Because the word would beat you home. That you had to be disciplined in school. And you embarrassed your parents, you were an embarrassment to the family, and they were going to make sure it didn't happen again when you got home. <laughs> so the teachers were parents, and because they were parents, our parents trusted them. People want to know why teachers can't discipline the child now. Because the parent looks at the teacher and sees an alien, that's why. Who's going to let an alien beat up on your child? Right. But somebody who's in the family. Right. You see, that's a different story. My mother could call me all the time, and she said it one time. In fact, I'm surprised that my mother, because she would have been today, arrested for child abuse. <laughs> <laughs> she said things to me like, boy, I'm going to kill you. I can just hear the social worker now. <laughs> Mrs. Hilliard, uh, that's a saw. <laughs> well, see, she didn't understand African language. I knew my mother didn't mean she was going to kill me. She knew that she didn't mean that. We understood what that meant. I never doubted my mother's love for me. But I realized at that point, it was something serious enough where she had to get my attention. Yeah, I understood that. That's the parenting function. You can do, if you're a parent, you can do virtually anything you want to do with children. And they respect you and respond to you. Our teachers were elders. Elders. Uh, I don't think we really appreciated this function yet. The elders are our perspective and our power. Those are the people who have the wisdom and the knowledge of the century wrapped up tightly inside, ready to be put at our disposal if we take time. Many of us don't think we have to take time because we know everything. Right. But the teachers that we had when I grew up were elders, and I respected that. They were our models, role models. It required a certain kind of character to be a teacher. They were dedicated. They were demanding. And our teachers were inbred with a sense of mission and purpose. And above all, our teachers were sacrificial. Now, I went into that long, drawn-out thing about Africa, and that long, drawn-out thing about Africans, even under oppression, maintaining excellence as education, simply to reinforce what you know, and that is that we know how to teach. If we don't know how to do anything else, we know how to teach. And we know how to do it well, and we've always known how to do it. And by the way, Anybody who knows something can teach it. I'm telling you that. The problem that I see is that people, don't, it's not that they have a bad method, it's that they don't have an understanding of what it is that they're trying to teach. If you have an understanding of something, you can teach it. Without the degree, as Garvey has shown. Matter of fact, in Marcus Garvey School, only 30, out of 33 teachers, only 30 have college degrees. That's where they, all the kids learn calculus. So obviously, the degrees weren't what caused it, right? Now, against what I've been talking about, why I said these things, I want you to listen to the last 10 years of national conversation on what people are going to do about school. I want you to listen to the language that's used in the last 10 years when people try to propose a solution to the problem, not just for our kids, but for everybody's kids. I want you to listen to this language. What they say they're going to do, they say they're going to have school reform. I don't know what that means. I think it means adding a day, maybe year-round operation. You know, instead of having a middle school have a junior high school, it's usually some tinkering with the system. But you notice what I was talking about was a whole other category of topic. Minimum competence. There was a whole national movement on minimum competence. Look, look, I'm talking about the people who are charged with the responsibility of rescuing our kids. And these are the proposals that are supposed to fix the schools that have our kids in them. 
You can feed it and not going to get there. This is not going to be a tank of gas when I finish. Effective school. School choice. Charter school. Vocational education. School restructuring. If I see one more person tell me they restructured school, I'm going to slap <laughs> Did you restructure? Yes, we restructured last week. How about you? Well, no, we're going to restructure in January. It's a nice language. It doesn't mean anything. In fact, they don't even know how to restructure. You're going to restructure, you got to restructure the structure, not the manifestation of the structure. <laughs> Architects tell me form follows function. Form is structure. But it's supposed to come after you make a good decision about the function. And then I ask them, well, what does function follow? Functions come after you have a theory and a philosophy. Now, if you're going to restructure schools, you don't start with the building. You start with the theory and the philosophy. I've already been spelling out an African theory and an African philosophy as one alternative. What's the other theory and philosophy? I can tell you it's not there. So what people are doing, basically, is rearranging the chairs on the Titanic and calling it restructuring. <laughs> Site-based management. Total quality management. Minority to majority. Year-round school. Magnet school. Boot camp. Where's the visionary? Where's the parenting? Where's the elder? Where's the dedication? Where's the demand? Where's the students who respect and care and know and create and question? Where are the people who teach to the intellect and to the humanity? Where is the bond to the students and schools and community? It's not in there. And yet those are the things that will fix the school. So you can see why I'm concerned, not because other people don't understand it, but because our own community doesn't understand it. And as a result of that, give credence to people who have no idea, not one clue about what to do to raise the achievement of our children or even the goals to which that ought to be directed. I can tell you this, out of respect and in memory and honor of our departed brother, Amos Wilson. Our children, our children, this is African children, all of them, every last one of them, are thinking, motivated geniuses. That's the absolute truth. See, I, I, I tell people this, I don't care who the audience is, I tell them the same thing. And then, then people look at you with the public because now they look at the little guy laying down with his head on the desk, pencil in his mouth, eyes closed, everything. And you mean to tell me that is a motivated, thinking, genius? And I said, yeah. I said, all it takes is the right conditions to release the genius that's bound up in that child, and he'll do what Shabazz had them do. But if you don't believe that, you will tolerate the structure of a school that assumes that one-fourth of the people in America, black and white, are so dumb, they will never be able to learn enough to pay for their education. That's what the bell curve is about, that book. That's what they say. Our children are the children of the future. You know, one of the things is so uh, wonderful to me as I look at how brilliant they are. Uh, the best place you can find it is with the rappers. You want to see how brilliant black minds are. See, some people can rap and some people can't rap. Uh, try to get Europeans to rap. <laughs> try to stop any young brother from rapping. That's what, look, we, we came here rapping. In fact, they were rapping in the Caribbean before they were rapping here. They used to call it reggae. Really? They were doing all that. Calypso, they were rapping the reggae and calypso. They were rapping in Africa before they rapped in the Caribbean. In fact, what I found when I was there 
was that they said to me, man, if you ever get a Liberian a chance to talk, he will win the argument. They said, never let a Liberian man talk in court. Because by the time he finished talking, he's going to convince you up and down, left and right, black and white, whatever it is to you. He's that good. We're rappers. I saw a little brother on TV. I remember the Carl Boyd show. He was interviewing about the black male. That's the periodically people showing ourselves in our worst situation. This brother was running through a whole lot of women and everything, and exhibiting a whole lot of negative behavior. And that was the purpose of the show. I saw that, but I also saw something else. Because he asked that brother, he said, look, he said, uh, I know that you're uh, a rapper. He said, but what is this rap thing? He said, well, I'm just talking about experience. He said, but I mean, how do you make it up in your head? He said, this time you memorize and then you practice and then, he said, no, that's the way you do it. <laughs> <laughs> he, said, he said, well, could you make up a rap like that? I said, yes. Yeah. He said, well, what is that anything? Tell me something to rap about. He said, I can rap about that wall. And then the rap, I'll rap about this bread. The guy said, right? He said, right. Brother rolled right into his rap. On the brick, just made it up out of his hair. That's genius. Now, you may not want to pay for it, but he just demonstrated for you a computer with a gigabyte of memory, a Pentium chip, and a 100 megahertz processing speed. Now, the problem that I have is to get our folks to see the problem. That's the only problem I see. We got all this genius in our children. We got all this genius in our teachers. And they're invisible in the African community. People don't know they're there, so they lose trust in themselves. They lose trust in our own leadership. And when they lose trust in themselves and their own leadership, then they begin to trust in strangers and aliens. And the minute they go down that road, they bring back to us these crippled solutions that will cripple us even further. What we need right now is a right to pass. Right. Yes, that will include the kind of thing that Dr. Adelaide Sanford is now leading the Board of Education for People of African Ancestry, where we sit down and think about what it is that we need so that we can specify the nature of the education that we want our children to receive. That's what we need, and we need chapters of that all over this country. It's unfortunate that in some of the biggest cities in the world, with some of the most degrees, I live in one of them, the greatest number of degrees per capita in the world. And where is the independent think tank designing the future of education for African people? We're doing it through other people's structures. So we need that board function. Then we need a board of elders to oversee what we come up with. You need to run past the elders, see the solutions. Because sometimes they can see that we've been there before. That's not something you got to do again. And it's not consistent with the ma'at that we're supposed to be representing and reflecting, or whatever it is, but we need to institutionalize that elder oversight function. We've lost it. We don't talk to our people anymore, the old people. And then, of course, we need a teacher training process, a retraining process. This is one of my fondest dreams, that one day we will set up a training process. In fact, that's where I was yesterday with Dr. Wade Norton, because he has tried to establish a teacher training process. That's what you have to have. If you want the kind of outcomes that I was talking about, you've got to train teachers in a different way. You have to put them through a different process. You will not be able to do that at Columbia University. All right. You will not be able to do that at New York University. You can only do that in a training structure that you control totally. And that's what we have to have. The three things that we have to have in order to get ourselves out of the mess that we're in. Because no one knows the answer to how to fix our children better than we do. We need control of the education process in whole or in part. We need a perfect educational agenda. But we've thought about where it is that we have to go. We don't need any more Jesse Jones telling us what to do. Amen. And finally, 
We need to execute the plan. Because it's not enough to plan to plan. We got a plan to act. And so once we have the control and project an agenda in the African way, then we can guide our people where they're supposed to be. Thank you. Dr. Asa Hilliard, let's give her a big round of applause. Dr. Asa Hilliard. Those of you who are going up the aisle now, stop. Hold some black person's hand if you love them. If you don't love them, keep walking. <laughs> We get ready to get out of here. We get ready to make an, an African affirmation. It only takes one or two more minutes. Black people got to go through African rituals. We got to go through an African commitment. It's not enough just to come and hear and then fall down at the finish line and not make the African affirmation to us. I want to thank Dr. Hughes tonight for that very inspiring message. I want to let him know that we are indeed making them to meet the challenge. I had an opportunity to go to our Freedom Retreat in July, and I wish everybody had been able to go there and watch the destruction that was taking place between Africans, Africans teaching Africans, elders, teaching our future leaders. If you could just see that, it will really turn your hearts. Many of us don't get out and really see a real exhibit of what is taking place. That was a tremendous experience at a tremendous expense on our part, but it was well worthwhile. We have the tools right here if we will make the investment we can build a great university right here if we will make the investment. We can turn buildings on Fulton Street into educational institutions right here if we would just make the investment. We're just holding ourselves back. And as I looked at those children, I cried because I knew it was only for a season. And there was no reason why it couldn't be permanent and year long, but we are not willing to make the investment. We want to talk about it, we want to rap about it, but we don't want to be for real. We invest in the wrong people. I was down at the Neil Booster Mall today and recognized we were the only ones that was there. If we had not been there, the court world would have been bad. No black people at all. Then I thought if Reverend Ike had been on trial, <laughs> you could have gotten nowhere near the courtroom. <laughs> Our values are screwed up. And they're misplaced. Mm -hmm. Go to any church on Sunday, and you'll never get the message that you get here. Mm -hmm. But we invest in Reverend Hoopenhoff. <laughs> but we don't invest in somebody who can really give us a real message. Our values are really screwed up. It's not that we don't have great resources and great institutions here. We just refuse to utilize and to expand on them. We talk about Dr. Shabazz. We've had him here for two years in succession, right here, along with a lot of other great people. We have great resources right here, but we just marginalize what we have because we're still in some way addicted to white folks. And we're still committed to them. This is the reason why I do not let white folks in here so that you can really see the genius of black people and see what that's really about. Even if the authorities come down hard on me, I'm man enough to withstand that. I can withstand these crackers. And they know that. And I welcome their talent. I like for them to come down hard on me because it proves to you that we can beat them back. That's why I try to give these crackers reasons to come up, down on me so that I can instill confidence in you and that we can win and that we can be victorious. 
And I hope that when Dr. Hilliard come here again, that we will show him signs and exhibits of our revolutionary and evolutionary minds, and that we have a commitment to an African people, and that when we say this African affirmation, it is for real, and it has real meaning. Please repeat after me. We're an African people. We're an African people. Robbed of our homeland. Robbed of our homeland. Robbed of our name. Robbed of our name. Our languages. Our languages. Our culture. Our culture. Our religion. Our religion. Our womanhood. Our womanhood. Our manhood. Our manhood. Our sisterhood. Our sisterhood. Our brotherhood. Our brotherhood. And our self-respect. And our self-respect. But we shall rise. We shall rise. Never to fall again. Up, you mighty race. Up, you, mighty race. you can accomplish up, what you will. you will. No justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. Hold the person next to you. Let them know you're glad that they're still out And thank Dr. Ace for this inspiring message. Sister Rosalind Jeffers, Sister Rosalind Jeffers. Now, as many of you know, we are extremely fortunate to have this sister. Let's give her a warm round of applause, Sister Rosalind Jeffers, uh, our sister. We can take this photograph because we know Dr. Jeffers hasn't gotten here yet. <laughs> All right, it's too early for him, it's nine o'clock, so if y'all don't tell, we won't. All right, uh, certainly with such a distinguished guest tonight, uh, it would be most fitting uh, someone that we love who also loves our internationally recognized speaker make an introduction of him. And at this time, we're going to turn the program over to Dr. Sister Rosalind Jeffries. Let's give her a warm round of applause. All right. <laughs> Greetings, brothers and sisters, Hotep. And we are full of life here. We all stand for these lies and this hypocrisy that's coming at us at every direction. We have the fire and the substance to stand up and battle away from us at every turn because we got a great God that lives in us. We are not dead. We are alive. And so I'm here this evening to stand before you to introduce to you one of who needs no full introduction because those are amongst us who are our fathers and our educators and our true teachers and bring forth the light and the substance uh, when word gets around and we know who they are. And so Dr. Asa Hilliard is such a person like that that's been amongst us. Leonard and I have known him from back Back in the 60s, from the time that we were in California, and Leonard was setting up the Black Studies Department at San Jose State University, and at that time, uh, Dr. Asa Hilliard III was the Dean of Education at San Francisco State University. And so, um, 
We have known him for a long time. He, well, we were tracking back and forwards to Africa, my first trip, 1960, Leonard, 1961, doing things, etc. Asa was also tracking back and forwards to Africa. Although he lived there for a substantial period of time, uh, for a number of years, and even I think his two children were born in Africa. And uh, so he has a long history of working in the international arena as well as on the local level. Uh, we know Dr. Asa Hilliard uh, is the Fuller Callaway Professor of uh, Urban Education at Georgia State University. And so those kinds of positions, see, even the folks down at that university knew what to do with Asa. Some people you don't know because they have, uh, they're a think tank, their mind works in the right way, their spirit is right. You take those kind of people and let, sit them down and let them think. And so that his job is one where he's not overburdened sometimes with some of the things that local teachers are. He has the time to go and to develop things like they, like, uh, and so we, he has been one developing and decoding information for us for a long time and bringing back and sharing with us the things that we need. If there's one word that I really want to say about Asa too, it's relevance, that he brings information that's not all chewed up stuff you heard before over and over again, but he's able to take that material and apply it to a situation. I remember how inspired I was when I heard him give those talks about how the Germans by name and by institution took information um, and the truth and how they turned it into lies and led into the propaganda to uh, mess with our minds, the details in psychology. And those were phenomenal things and keys that we needed to know and to learn to make ourselves more correct. Uh, we know that uh, Dr. Hilliard uh, had uh, uh, the conference that he invited me to be a part of down at Georgia State College, uh, which was called the Infusion of Africa and African-American content in the school curriculum. That was in 1989. But even before that conference, he had invited me down to work with the uh, uh, school teachers of Georgia State, Georgia as a state. And so he gathered together the top minds and the top people uh, in African American uh, uh, education, history, uh, psychology, and uh, theology, and brought us all in together at that particular conference. And I always remembered when I went down there, uh, Asa doesn't know this, but I uh, was standing on the side and, and um, down where he works and um, uh, working for, getting all of the coordination of all of the things going. And I saw some secretaries that he went to and they were all smiling and everything. And when he turned his back and went away, they didn't know who I was just standing there, but they had to assume I was nobody just standing there. And they just turned just the opposite. I said, look at here, look at, look at these white folks are devils, totally. And I said, is this what Asa has to work with every day and come and look them in the eyes and look them in the face and deal with these lecherous people that were, uh, were, were terrible. And so that we know once again that this is what people have to go up with. In Africa, they have a big staff with an egg in the hand and that staff they'll hold up every so often. And that, what, that, what that means is that remind you of how you have to treat your leaders. People like Alton Maddox and uh, like Asa Hilliard, people who put their lives on the line. You have to hold them like an egg in a hand. You can't hold them too tight because if you do, they don't have the freedom to go and do what they have to do. You can't lock them into little mundane things all the time. You have to let them ride and fly like eagles. But at the same time, if you don't hold it firm enough and tight enough, then there'll be problems. And so you don't want to crush your leaders and you want to give them the, the substance and the, the support that they need. And so
so that's what we learn from Africa how to take care of our leaders and to appreciate them at every turn to obedient be obedient to their calls and when they ask you to sacrifice go ahead and make the sacrifice I mean what else are we living for but to sacrifice our life so that things will be better for us all and for the generations to follow it's an opportunity and we should be glad to lay down our lives for these kinds of causes that we have and so I'm, I'm, I'm going to be stop in a few minutes but I want to mention again that Asa Hilliard was um did some monumental work with Les Develt Middleton when he created a series of, uh, of uh, educational data and material for the South Carolina network uh, that he worked for that went out around the country and in particular out from Washington, D.C. It was Asa Hilliard that played a key role. Asa Hilliard was also one of the founding directors and officers of ASCAC, the Association for the Study of African Classical Civil Civilization, and uh, he's the current vice president of ASCAT. And ASCAT has its tentacles throughout the country in small study groups and regional groups so that we work at the grassroots level uh, to get the information there and then to hook up the various groups. And of course, the culmination of uh, some of those activities, we always remember uh, doc, uh, Dr. Hilliard was talking about, yes, we have the Million Man March, but in 1987, before the Million Man March, we had a thousand uh, uh, people's march. And that was the one that went to Kemet. It's not easy, but can you imagine? Even uh, Sullivan, when he was having people come to have a business arrangement, uh, uh, we were interested in that too. But people did not respond the way they did for the 1987 uh, march in Kemet, going to study. And so I was saying to myself, why is it, what was different about the Sullivan call and the call that went out to uh, Kemet? What was different? And that difference was, yes, we want these business deals and arrangements, and we need those things done vitally. But at the same time, we've been filled with people that are misleading us and the hypocrisy in high places and wickedness all over, and so all those turnover. But the call that came for people running to Kemet was because they were seeking after what? After the absolute truth of who we are, where we came from, and the power and the essence to be activated to move forward. And so with that power and the essence, we know that that's what UAM is about. Not just taking the information in antiquity and leaving it there, but we have to grab it and, and uh, have it vital and relevant for our time right now. So, um, Without any more uh, to do, I want to also just quickly mention that when people needed a spokesman, when we had the problems in TNEC in the public schools, it was Asa that we were able to bring in, and Asa flew in to help to solve some of the racial problems that existed in the TNEC public schools. Uh, also, Adelaide Sanford has had him fly in to help to work out situations specifically for her. And so he's been a troubleshooter like that for many, many people around the country in these educational systems. And so we're thankful for the role that he plays, and we are indeed honored for him. And so the person that's coming forward will be our Dr. Asa Hilliard, and I want you to rise to receive him uh, because he's a person of honor, a person of dignity that is uh, indeed worthy of your respect. <laughs> Dr. Asa Hilliard, let's give it up. African family, I thank you for the reception and to Brother Maddox uh, express my deepest appreciation to you for the invitation, but also for your continuing leadership, sacrifice, for your courage, uh, for never letting us down. Uh, to my sister Roslyn, who uh, my last image of is standing in Elmina Castle. 
talking to the stone walls in August uh, with her poetic explanation of what had taken place there. And this was with the ASCAC conference this summer. And she and Brother Leonard did a duet in Elmina Castle. And it was a thing of beauty. And to her, I'm very appreciative that you came to do the introduction. I thank you. I want to talk about genocide, homicide, and suicide. And I want to talk about to move from those three killers to wholeness through the education and socialization process. I have to think that way because I'm a teacher and I'm a psychologist. I wish I were an investor and an economist and a political scientist and I would be able to talk more about that part of the job that we have to do, <clears throat> excuse me, but I have to talk about those things that I'm closer to. And of course, these things are very important. Uh, but before I get into the substance of what I want to say, I'd like to take you back once again to something that I know many here probably already know about, which is the teachings of Patahotep. Uh, the teachings of Patahotep, as you know, constitute the oldest whole book in human history. And uh, although I've read this book many times and edited a volume to try to bring some of the insights of the teachings of Patahotep to a broader audience, uh, every time I read it, I get new insights and new angles on it. And not long ago, I was asked to make a speech by a brother who worked for the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta about violence. And I don't know if you know it or not, but people have theories about violence that pertain to us. In fact, one of the largest studies of violence is now being done on black people. Um, they thought they had shut it down, but they didn't. It's being run out of Boston and Chicago. DNA is being taken from young black males to find out whether or not they are violent in their genes. Um, and I turned down the invitation three times, in fact, but for the main reason is that I don't talk about violence um, as an expert. I talk about things I try to study about and know about. And I told this person that, I said, I, I won't do it because I'm not prepared. I said, not only that, but I probably won't take the position that you want me to take. I'm assuming I know what position you want me to take. And uh, he said, well, no, you can say whatever you want to say. He said, the reason I'm interested is because I think that you will bring a different angle to this than the one we're working with right now. So to make a long story short, what I did was to insist that uh, the position that should be taken, of course, should be anti-violence, not non-violence. Right. Anti-violence, right. <laughs> which means we don't want violence. <laughs> I'm not sure what nonviolence means. All right. All right. And in order to talk about that and to deal with what I thought the real problem was, which is the definition problem, the problem of, uh, of violence is pictured on the evening news as a young African male leaning over a police car with his hands cuffed behind him and someone hitting him with a flashlight. Uh, someone stabs or shoots another person and that's violence. But I thought that violence had to be redefined. 
because I thought oil spills were violent. All right. All right. I thought insider trading on Wall Street that makes old people lose their savings is violent. All right. All right. All right. All right. All right. I thought that lying in Hollywood is violence. Right. Right. I thought that scholarship that closes black studies programs down right. is violent. <clears throat> And I thought that if we're going to draw DNA, we need to draw DNA from those violent people and study what makes them so genetically violent. <laughs> so I started off in trying to broaden the definition of violence um, by referring to what it turned out after I reread Patahotep was the oldest anti-violence literature on earth. Right. Turns out that out of all of the teachings, 37 specific teachings of Batahotep, half of them are specifically recipes for anti-violence. Right. I'm interested specifically in two of those teachings, but I want to just take a moment to go through some of the teachings so you'll get the flavor of Patahotep, even if you've read it before, you may not have read it looking for its anti-violence content. All right. In fact, the first teachings of Patahotep, teaching number two, after the general teaching, number one, about pride and arrogance, it says, if you meet a disputant in the heat of action, one who is more powerful, Simply fold your arms and bend your back because to confront him will not make him agree with you. All right. And pay no attention to his evil speech because if you confront him while he is raging, then people will call him an ignoramus All right. and your self-control will be the match for his evil utterance. All right. Now if you see young men confronting each other in that way. Sometimes it's good before taking that final step to take another step as the intermediate step before you have to resort to the final step. All right. In the second, he said, what if you meet a dispute who is your equal, one on your level? You will overcome him by being silent while he is speaking evil. And then there will be much talk among those who hear and your name will be held in high regard among the great. And then the third condition, if you meet a disputant in action who is a poor man, who is not your equal, you're more strong than he, All right. then do not attack him because he is weak. Leave him alone. All right. He will confound himself. All right. Do not answer him just so that you can relieve your heart. Do not vent yourself against your opponent. All right. Wretched is he who injures a weak man. If you ignore him, then listeners will wish to do what you want and you will beat him through their opinion of him. All right. Now there's, I'm gonna skip this next one because it's probably one of the two most important nonviolent, or not nonviolent, anti-violent teaching. You gotta make sure I watch my language. If you are a person of trust sent by one great person to another great person, be careful to stick to the essence of the message that you were asked to transmit. Give the message exactly as he gave it to you. Guard against provocative speech which makes one great person angry with another. Just keep to the truth. We used to call that agitation, All right. signifying even. All right. You could get to that level. All right. So that true messages and guarding against provocation, even though there may have been a provocation in the message, Patahotep says, do not repeat the outburst that the person who sent the message gave because you don't want to provoke violence. That's an anti-violence teaching. All right. How about in child rearing? If you are a wise man, train up a son who will be pleasing to God. 
If he is straight and takes after you, and take, you then must take good care of him. Do everything that is good for him because he is your son. Your soul begot him. Do not withdraw your heart from your son, but an offspring can make trouble. If your son strays and neglects your counsel and disobeys all that is said with his mouth spouting evil speech, then punish him for his talk. God will hate him who crosses you, and his guilt was determined in the womb. He who God makes boatless cannot cross the water. Now here's another little formula for anti-violence. If you're a person who judges, listen carefully to the speech of one who pleads. Do not stop the person from telling you everything that they had planned to tell you. A person in distress wants to pour out his or her heart even more than they want their case to be won. If you're one who stops a person who is pleading, that person will say, why does he reject my plea? Of course, not everything that one pleads for can be granted, but a good hearing soothes the heart. Listen. So just good listening right. is an anti-violence prescription. Right. Let me then go to, there are others, but let me go to the two anti-violence teachings that I want to emphasize tonight. One, it's Patahotep number five. It says, if you are a man who leads, All right. a man who controls the affairs of many, right. then seek the most perfect way of performing your responsibility. All right. Let your conduct be blameless. All right. All right. Great is ma'at, right. truth, justice, and righteousness. Ma'at has been unchanged since the time of God. And then the anti-violence aspect, to create obstacles to the following of the laws is to open a way to a condition of violence. I'll say it again. <laughs> See, the person who breaks the law may be violent. But the person who created the obstacles right. that provoked another person into breaking laws is also a violent person. All right. All right. That's what Patahotep said. All right. All right. To create obstacles, All right. to make it impossible, to take people's food so that they have to steal to eat, mm. yes. All right. to prevent people from working, to break up families right. by destroying the young men right. is to create the conditions that then produce the violence and that person is just as violent as the violence that they create. All right. All right. And it says the transgressor of laws, that is the one who did the first violent act, is punished. All right. Although the greedy person and let's listen to that word greed because it will come up in the next teaching. All right. The greedy person misses that fact. Baseness may obtain riches, All right. but crime never lands its wares on the shore. In the end, that person who produces the condition that leads to violence will be disturbing Ma'at. All right. And in the end, Ma'at lasts. Ma'at is my father's ground. Right. And finally, anti-violence. If you want to have perfect conduct, to be free from every evil, then above all, guard against the vice of greed. Mm. Greed is a grievous sickness that has no cure. There is no treatment for it. It embroils the father. Greed embroils the father. Greed provokes violence. It embroils the fathers and mothers. It embroils the mothers and the brothers of the mothers. It parts the wife from the husband. Greed is the compound of all evils. All right. It is a bundle of all hateful things. Right. That person endures whose rule is rightness, 
who walks a straight line, for that person will leave a legacy by such behavior. On the other hand, the greedy person has no tomb. So we have two additions to the thought about violence. All right. Not just the one who provokes an obvious violent act, All right. but the one who creates the conditions right. that produce the violent is violence, and then the one who is greedy is the one who is likely to produce the conditions that lead others to produce violence. Greed right. and activities in high places. This is at the level of public policy. That's violence at the level of public policy. Welfare reform is violent. To take bread out of children's mouths, to take food out of the mother's mouth, the destruction of the protection from racism and employment is violent. To destroy the affirmative, minimum affirmative action, rulings that protect the people, is a public policy that creates the conditions that allow people to respond or provoke some people to respond in ways that are inappropriate. I just want you to think about that for a moment because I'm going to talk about three violent things. I'm going to talk about genocide. I'm going to talk about homicide briefly. And then I'm going to talk about suicide. And I think in order to talk about genocide, I need to be precise. I may have spoken about this once before when I was at the slave, I'm not sure, but I'm going to do it again anyway. I want to read the precise definition of genocide. It makes a difference whether you use a word with knowledge or whether you just use a word as a cliché. William Patterson, in the book that was written by some African Americans, we charge genocide. It was a petition to the United Nations for relief from a crime of the United States government against Negro people, published by international publishers here in New York. Book has a publication date of 1971. I don't know if you know, I think people like Ossie Davis and a whole bunch of other people brought this petition of genocide. They charge genocide. But in order to charge genocide, you have to define what genocide is. All right. And here's what the United Nations right. Charter says. The General Assembly of the United Nations adopted something that they called the Genocide Convention right. on this December 9, 1948. Article 2 of that convention defines genocide as any one of the following acts right. committed with the intent to destroy right. in whole or in part a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group as such right. to the attempt to destroy in whole or in part a national, racial, or ethnic group as such. All right. The attempt to destroy a community, in other words, All right. by one of the following methods. All right. A, killing members of the group All right. constitutes the genocide that most of us are familiar with. All right. B, it is also genocide to cause serious bodily or mental harm All right. to members of the group. All right. That's genocide. All right. Just causing distress, mental distress to members of a group. All right. And three, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part. That means not killing, but creating the conditions that lead to death. All right. That's also genocide. All right. 
and then D, imposing measures intended to prevent births within a group is genocide. <laughs> and then fifth, forcibly transferring the children from one group to members of another group All right. is genocide. All right. That's the UN Charter. That's the UN Convention. I'm sorry. All right. Now, the man who thought up this word, at least the one who's given credit for it, is a man named Raphael Lemkin. All right. He clarified it even more. And he said, genocide can be affected by physical, political, social, cultural, biological, economic, religious or moral oppression, any one of those. I'd like to have you think specifically about culture. The cultural oppression of a people is genocide. See, there was a wonderful book written by Dr. Yosef Ben Yakinen called Cultural Genocide and the African, Black and African Studies Curriculum. A lot of people ask, why you put a word like that in a title of a book like that? Why wouldn't genocide have more to do with armed struggle? But cultural genocide is armed struggle. And our people haven't gotten it yet. And so when I say suicide, or actually genocide, of course, physical is important, but so is cultural. And then it can be direct or it can be indirect. It can be indirect if people just operate in such a way that they ignore you to the point where you can't manifest your culture. It can be direct if people calculate and design to prevent you from practicing your culture. And why would that be true? Why would that be genocide? Why would preventing people from practicing their culture be genocide? It would be genocide because culture is the tie that binds, the glue that holds a group together, the glue that makes for the possibility of unity, the glue that makes for the possibility of collaboration. Anybody serious in the study of humanity understands this. I don't think our people get it. I've just been talking to some people the last few days that blow my mind. I sat down at the table two nights ago with someone, and this woman was saying, well, you know, (laughs) I thought I was talking to an African, but it wasn't. (laughs) And she said, you know, we don't really have anything, anything that connects us to Africa. And I sat there with my mouth, I'm not shocked at much, but I couldn't believe this. And she's sitting there with an afro, <laughs> dressed in African clothes. And she said, no, we don't have it. Of course, she made an interesting choice of a mate. All right. And so that might explain why she's confused about the origin, her own origin. And then she went further than that, and she said, you know, it, of course, I understand that we came from Africa, but there's nothing of Africa left in us. And that our problem is how to fit into this cultural stream that is the majority cultural stream. That's our only job. And she said, that's what I intend to do with my leadership role, is to help people fit into this cultural stream. So I'm shocked because I say, well, you know, other people understand the function of culture. And so many of us have forgotten it. Treat it casually and communicate that to our children. I think the last time I was up here, I probably mentioned the book Tribes by Kotkin. It's very clear, according to Kotkin, that three things account for the power of global groups that rule the world. Ethnic identity is strong. That produces the possibility for trust, which then produces the possibility for collaboration. 
They have a global sense of themselves. And they have a passionate commitment to technology. All right. And these things with the cultural bond allows the group to function even when it crosses national boundaries. All right. So that they're global, not local. All right. And we have evolved to the point that so many of our people are local people in a global world. And have no knowledge and understanding of a connectedness to anyone outside the local community. Don't understand. Don't see it. And you know what's pitiful? When we were over in Ghana this last summer, is the same kind of thinking is growing on the continent itself. Growing on the continent as alien ideologies compete for the minds of people. When a young man stands up on a bus and says, that um, he was talking to a priest and then he was talking to a fetish priest. I said, who is the fetish priest? He said, you know the fetish priest. I said, wait a minute, I don't understand. Who is the fetish priest? He said, he's the one that handles fetishes. I said, oh, you mean the Catholic priest? He had the cross, the holy water, and things like that. He said, no, no, no. I mean, the African, the Ghanaian traditional priest. I knew what he was doing. That's the term that's used. And I find not only do we use it, Ghanaians use it to their own people. And then I had a young man on the same bus sat down and bragged about the fact that he was no longer a pagan. I said, wait, if you want to join somebody's church, that's fine. But why does that require you to call your own daddy a pagan and your mother a pagan? So I'm saying minds are being changed because people no longer understand the bond and how it's created and the meaning of having bonds in a global world. So we haven't understood it. So we become ripe for genocide. And so how does, how does the genocide occur? How does the genocide of African people occur? It's very simple. But I don't think our people really at the mass level understand this. I know we understand it here, that's why we're here. But I'm just saying, we have not gotten this message out to the masses, they don't understand it. For example, the genocide occurs when someone else can define who you are. Richard B. Moore, in the wonderful book that he wrote, The Name Negro, Its Origin and Evil Use. See, a lot of people have grown into the name Negro and can't give it up now. A lot of people grew into the word colored and can't give it up now. And what else would you grow into that you can't give up now? Because there are those who are naming us now and naming our children, and we're not objecting to it. Right. Raphael Powell, in the book, The Human Side of a People and Its Right Name. I'm just talking about people here in New York who met in committees because this name thing was so serious. Richard B. Moore chaired a committee of Africans to sit down and think about this name thing. Dr. Clark was on that committee. John Henry Clark was on that committee. They wrote to the New York Times and they said to the New York Times, don't call us Negroes, don't call us colored, refer to us as African people, put us back into the stream of history. And the New York Times wrote back and said, we will not permit you to tell us how to name you. <laughs> Get the book. The letter from the New York Times back to the committee is in the book. The name Negro, its origin, evil use. They say that slaves are named by their masters and dogs are named by their masters, but free men must name themselves. But then when free men name themselves the same names that the master named them, that's genocide. <laughs> that's genocide. 
And so we have those now, some of them at Harvard, who insist that they're Negroes and coloreds and minorities. And at risk and disadvantaged and culturally deprived and who make no noise about the names that their children are called. And I see it all the time because I'm in the school. What does it do to be a minority, to be a Negro, to be colored? What does it do? It moves you immediately off of the map because there's no place on the map for Negroes, colored, disadvantaged, at risk. And it moves you immediately out of time because there's no time where there's ever been Negroes, colored. That means you cannot be a human being out of space and out of time. See, people see this, I'm, I'm only anxious about this because more and more I'm hearing people who say the names that you call doesn't mean anything and I'm hearing it out of the leadership. So to destroy community bonds, and I just read to you the definition of genocide as cultural, bonded community, the destruction of a community, to destroy those bonds is genocide. Just a couple months ago, we met down in Costa Rica. And one of the things that was interesting to me at this meeting of Africans, at a homecoming of Africans in Latin America. Now, we got a problem with that term, Latin America. Uh, but I'm not going to deal with Latin America. <laughs> I'm not even sure she'd be America, but it's certainly not Latin. There's nothing Latin about the part of the country that they're talking about, Central America and South America, nothing Latin about it other than the Spanish language that people speak. Most of the people in those countries are either Amerindians or Africans. And the people who were meeting there shocked me because I thought I knew something about the folk who were out there in the Caribbean and in South America and Central America had no idea. Thousands of people, brother came up to me from Colombia. He said, there's a whole bunch. He said, you know, there's hundreds of thousands of Africans in Colombia. He said, and you poured libations, we pour libations in Colombia. And of course, I knew the Brazilian brother was gonna tell me they did it there and I knew about the millions in Brazil. That was no shock. In fact, Brazil is an African country, not a Latin American country. Most of the Brazilian population is African, of African descent. And then a brother came up to me from Peru. He said, there are thousands of us in Peru, and we pour libation too, just like you did here. I said, of course you pour libation because you're African. And there's a move on by authorities that they have to deal with to get them not to call themselves Africans but Afro-Latins, <laughs> Afro-Latins. See, they're not Afro-Latin, they're Africans, speaking Spanish, although some of them speak English. The brother from Belize, they speak English, and they got conscious communities in Belize. The brothers in Costa Rica still speak English as a way of defiance against the Latin American. And in Limon, which is an African city, in Costa Rica, they are Africans with a Universal Negro Improvement Association active with a red, green, and black flag over the UNIA building on the corner next to the barbershop where the president of the UNIA still carries his business. They're Africans. To call them something else is to take them out of space and out of time. They're in Nicaragua. They're in Panama. Well, we know that. They're in Honduras. See, we didn't know how to deal with the whole Contra thing. In spite of this whole interesting thing coming up now, a lot of things going on with the Contra that we didn't understand at the time. Find out that military people for the United States government appear to be drug runners now and getting money for the Contra War by selling drugs to us. 
by selling drugs to us to kill us because who were the Contras? Fighting in Nicaragua. I got some books about the history of the Africans in Nicaragua. Who are the Mosquito Indians and what is their relationship to Africans? See, once you get taken out of space and time, you don't even ask those questions. If you're only from Philly, I'm from the Bronx, from Atlanta, <laughs> then there's no need to ask any question about Nicaragua, Honduras, Costa Rica. But there is an awakening among those people who never forgot. In spite of the fact that they were tried, the tip was made to name them out of themselves. How else can there be cultural genocide? The control of African scholarship. The containment of African scholarship. The containment of African scholarship prevents the transmission of culture from one generation to the next to make a people dependent upon other people to give their picture of themselves to their own children. That's genocide. That's why the attack on black studies program that is mounting with even more fervor than ever before, the closing of the program at City College and the virtual crippling of the programs that remain or the co-option of the programs that remain by people who are even hostile to the Black Studies program themselves. Bernal over Jop. You ever think about that? Why is Black Athena a bestseller and civilization of barbarism not? When Black Athena is 10 years later than civilization of barbarism and a weaker argument that essentially copies the same argument that Jop wrote That's the control of scholarship. Bloom at the University of Chicago wrote a book called Closing of the American Mind. That's a nice title. Universities all over the United States had workshops on that book. You owe it to yourself to read the book Closing of the American Mind. Why would, you know, the, the, the workshops that I know of that captured the attention of university presidents would get these books and ask their whole faculties to read them all across the United States. That was one by this Chicago professor, home of the great books of the Western world. Also a professor used to be up here at Cornell when the black students took over the black studies department with guns, took over the president's office or whatever they took over <laughs> up there with these guns. Uh, he was on the faculty then. The book was sponsored by the trustee who was on the faculty then. The Olin Foundation paid for the book. The Olin Foundation paid for another book that we will learn about. Mary Lefko is this, not out of Africa, you see? So here this man, angry at the University of Chicago, writing a book called Closing of the American Mind. The argument is that when they opened the doors to the university in the 60s, they let all these people in with these funny ideas. And now they're writing all these books that are destroying the foundation of Western civilization. See? And then he castigates specifically the Black Studies, African Studies program. Vitriolic, poisonous criticism. You ought to read it. If I had time, I would have brought the whole transcript and just read just how nasty. It doesn't sound like scholarship. It's not scholarship criticizing scholarship. It's propaganda against African scholarship. To control, to say that African people have no right to write their books. Or as Lefka says, to say that anything that people who are writing on behalf of African people say is myth and fraud in the face of all the fraud and mythology that's been perpetuated by people about African folk. You know the fraud that I'm talking about. You know that Brother Jake tells us, Jake Carruthers, 
They used to have some books called the Harvard Classics. This is another way to keep Africans away from themselves by establishing the norm. And the norm, not meaning the norm for Europeans, or the norm for everybody, but establishing the norm for everybody. And saying that you're not literate until you've read the right books. And the right books were decided at Harvard by the president of Harvard, Charles Eliot. And they gathered together all the books of the world. At that time, they had some of the books from Asia in there, but no African books. And then later, they had the great books of the Western world by uh, author from the University of Chicago. But the great books of the Western world did not have any Africa in it. Even though the people at the University of Chicago housed the Oriental Institute, which studied the Nile Valley. Rockefeller had set up the Oriental Institute and you had all the Egyptologists sitting right there at the University of Chicago when they wrote the great books of the world, the Western world, and never talked about the Nile Valley. Well, even if you say, well, we're not talking about African books, how can you leave those books out when the Western writers referred to them, like Plato? And then in the great books of the Western world, assuming that you're restricted to reading these in order to be a literate person, you have to read white supremacist texts. And Jake points out one of those texts, which I'll read for you from Montesquieu's Spirit of the Laws. So in order to be an educated person, culturally literate, read the great books of the Western world, which include this quote from Montesquieu. Were I to vindicate our right to make slaves of the Negroes, these would be my argument. The Europeans, having extirpated the Americas, that means had committed genocide on the Americas, were obliged then to make slaves of Africans for clearing such vast tracts of land. Sugar would be too dear if the plants which produced it were cultivated by anything other than slaves. These creatures are all over black and with such flat noses that they can scarcely be pitied. It's hardly to believe, hard to believe that God, who is a wise being, should place a soul, especially a good soul, in such a black, ugly body. The ne this is the great books of the Western world. The Negroes prefer a glass necklace to the gold which the polite nation so highly value. Can there be a greater proof of their waning common sense? It is natural to look upon color as the criterion of human nature. It is impossible for us to suppose these creatures to be men because allowing them to be men, a suspicion would follow that we ourselves are not Christians. Then he continued, the greatest part of the people of Africa are savages and barbarians. They are without industry or arts. They have gold in abundance, which they receive immediately from nature. Every civilized state, therefore, is in a condition to traffic with them to advantage by raising their esteem for things of no value and receiving a very high price in return. That's Montesquieu. That's the great books of the Western world. Hegel, in the great books of the Western world, also talks about the fact that Africa has no history of its own. It's capable of no development and culture. The enslavement to more advanced Europeans is necessary to the increase of human feeling among the Negro and is an advance toward becoming participants in a higher morality, a phase of education. So at this point, forget Africa and never mention it again because it's not any historical part of the world. It has no movement or development to exhibit any historical movement in it. That is in the northern part, talking about Egypt, is Asiatic or European. Carthage displayed there an important transitory phase, but as a Phoenician colony, it belonged to Asia. Egypt will be considered in reference to its Western phase, but it does not belong to the African spirit. What we properly understand by Africa is the unhistorical, underdeveloped spirit still involved in the threshold of mere nature, and which had to be presented here only as the, on the threshold of world history. So in order to be literate, you have to be anti-African. Patao Tep doesn't exist. 
The teachings of Mary Carey do not exist. The teachings of Kunanu do not exist. The great book of the dead does not exist. The control, see these are the things that have to be controlled. So when Africans began to discover their own literature, then that literature has either to be co-opted, transferred in its authorship to somebody else, or it has to be shut down as not relevant. In fact, one of the ways to close the literature of Africa down is to say it's mythopoetical literature, it's not philosophy. It's not science, and even the science is pragmatic. That's what I mean by the control of scholarship. Mary Lefkowitz, not out of Africa. Malefi is doing a book called Still Out of Africa. <laughs> Dr. Ben, I'm sorry, Dr. Clark cleaned her house the other night, as you know, on the video. I don't know if many of you know that Dr. Finch also did the same thing up at Brown University. She called him a couple of days before, trying to get things adjudicated <laughs> before the panel, because I think she knew what kind of whipping she was getting ready to get. And I hope that article is floating around. If you don't have it, I'd be happy to get it to you. Finch did a beautiful critique of a stupid position, a propagandistic position. Schlesinger wrote the same thing that Bloom wrote in Closing of the American Mind and Disuniting of America. The very fact that African scholars say something about themselves will have the effect of tearing down the unity of America, according to Arthur Schlesinger. Yeah, if it's based on a lie, it will. If it's based on these lies that I just got through reading, it will. To shut down the research, the publication, the hiring, the tenure of departments of African studies is to control scholarship. And we'll be back to the point where we were when the 60s started. Part of that argument was about scholarship. And you had newscasters on television and radio saying that there was not enough literature to have black studies programs. You couldn't have them because the books didn't exist. At the time that the Schomburg had 50,000 catalog volumes right up here in Harlem, the books didn't exist. At the time, the Moreland Spingham Library and Research Center existed on Howard University's campus and dozens of other research centers existed, but we did not exist. People never wanted us to open the books. That's genocide. To establish white supremacy scholarship as the norm is genocide. And I just read to you some of that scholarship from the great books of the Western world. Now we have the new one, Cultural Literacy by E.D. Hirsch. That's the second book that college presidents had their people read. And there was an attempt to establish that as the norm for information that would make you literate. William Bennett of the Heritage Foundation, who used to be the, uh, the secretary in education, William Bennett of that Heritage Foundation said he wanted to eliminate this SAT and the ACT and make a test based on the book Cultural Literacy, one fourth of whose items deal with Greek and Roman civilization. And then, Listen to the stupidity of the argument when somebody sits up talking about they mixed and want to make a big deal out of it. I don't hear anybody on that side talking about, yeah, I got one fourth Negro in me. <laughs> Even though they do. <laughs> but why do you suppose that classification system was put together? The destruction of unity. Media propaganda. Why is it that losing Isaiah can be a popular movie, even Academy Award nomination, and you can't even show Sankofa in a real theater? Not only can you not show it, you had a mobilization of people to make sure it never saw the light of day. That's genocide. The criminal injustice system. 
that takes millions of young men and incarcerates them when unequal penalties are being levied for the same crime. I was standing in February in a West Virginia prison and this is after the Million Man March and I told the brother, I said, I just can't, I mean, just the image of it, because I was there and I said, I thought there's a million men standing on this mall, but there's a million men just like them in the prisons. Same number, same number. And in this prison, they were bringing back the chain gang. And in this prison, the longest line that I saw was men lined up for their meds. That means the population is being controlled by medication. Some prisons I've seen for women, the medications are as high as 70% of the women are medication to keep them chilled out with drugs. And the school was closed in this prison. The computer class that was filled to overflowing and they had seven times as many brothers standing out waiting to get into the computer class as they had seats and they closed the class because they didn't have the budget to take care of it. And they took the TVs out of the brothers' cells, made them all watch in the common area. And they cut their food out. Their brothers told me the food that we were eating, they said, brother, this macaroni and cheese sure is good because our macaroni don't usually have cheese. I'm just saying to turn prisons into torture chambers and then to keep a brother in there longer than he's supposed to be and then to have that brother come back out with no skills, no education, having been abused for eight years and then you say go on back out there and make something up yourself. And welfare reform, which I already talked about. And taking public money from the welfare program, from the schools, the public schools, and giving public school money to rich people so that they can send their kids to school with $2,000 less tuition. And now to put your children in school where now it's the rule that the teachers are going to be aliens not members of the community. Where kids like the men in prison are gonna be drugged with Ritalin and silent because somebody says they're too active. Black boys are too active. And then where you give a little carrot of an SSI check so that mother will turn her own son in and tell, her, tell that boy to go to school and act crazy so that they can put you in special ed and give you some tablets so that I can get the social security check because you're handicapped. I'm telling you what's going on, folks. There are two million children every day taking tablets for hyperactivity. Tracking the children. Alien curriculum for the children. They cannot find themselves in the school curriculum. You think, I, I don't know if you know how pitiful these things are unless you're in and out of school. For me to go back to my own school and to hear the principal tell me that they have now changed the law so that they're not busing anymore. So now you got neighborhood schools again. My school is now 100% African again but the teachers are not. But here's what's even worse. The principal said, I tried to get some African teachers over here, offer jobs to them. She said, these European teachers that came, they chose to be here, they wanna be here. This is not their last assignment of last resort, but the African teachers told me they didn't wanna work with African children. They wanna go out to the suburb so that they can move on up the line. That's a different environment than the one that I had. That's genocide. To break up 
the cultural transmission process that allows a group to know itself through time and space, dismantling the legal protections, got the technical situation. Everybody knows that we jelly beans now. <laughs> Porch monkeys. They're trying to, got a linguist out there trying to clean up the transcript now and say, what you think you heard is not what you heard. Didn't say nigger, said St. Nicholas. <laughs> but they haven't been able to clean up porch monkey. Haven't been able to clean up tough monkey. See, tough monkey is the black athlete. Porch monkey is the black person that they sit out front to pretend they got a whole lot working when they're not. Other monkeys are white women. They got a problem with all things Kwanzaa. The man who is the EEOC, or the EEOC had already had Texaco on probation. They already had suits against him at the time that this conversation took place, which you would never have heard if it hadn't been for the tape. None of these things happened. Furman never used the N-word until the tape came out. Rodney King was an animal until you saw the animals beating him when the tape came out. And then, of course, shredding the evidence of the misdeeds deliberately. See, that, to me, is bigger than the names they call us. The fact that they say we will get rid of the evidence so nobody can see what we do around here. And it's not only Texaco, it's also Avis that has, and then two other oil companies that have suits against them right now for the same practices, but no tapes. And on and on and on. Let's talk for a moment about homicide. That's just cultural, that's just cultural genocide. That's all I was talking about there. Interfering with the capacity of a group Killing the group by destroying the material that binds it together, that prevents its capacity to mobilize, to act and function on its own behalf with a purpose and a direction that it sees for itself that grows out of its own long traditions. That's genocide. Homicide. Of course, a lot of this we're doing to each other. A lot of the homicide can be direct and indirect. We got too many of our children killing each other. Killing each other for, we know for the wrong reason. We also know, <laughs> sometimes the homicide borders on suicide. <laughs> I'll say something about suicide for a moment, but you know, Brother Listerville died this year. Um, when Brother Listerville died, I watched him every week as he got weaker and weaker and weaker and they tried all kinds of things. We thought he was healed up until September. Uh, we thought that the cancer wasn't coming back and then one day we were supposed to do a program together and the night before he called me and said it's back. And then he had to go through a series of bone marrow transplants. And they began to look around for donors <laughs> and over the time they finally found donors in cancer transplants they try to find five characteristics to match and if you get four matches that's a pretty good chance five is really good and they actually found people that matched Listerville five for five so we were very hopeful that this match of bone marrow transplant which he then had to have they've been giving him his own bone marrow back after they cleaned it up before but that didn't work, so they had to get some fresh bone marrow. And then they finally decided to look at his family members, and they found out that his son, his son, Bakari, had three characteristics that matched five, the five characteristics that had, he had three of them. And then they decided not to take the, the matches five for five, 
but to take three for five from the sun because they said that in transplanting material that the immune system is more likely to reject even a five for five match if that person is not family than it is a three for five match if that person is family. So isn't that something? <laughs> I hope you, this is the metaphor. <laughs> Listerveld's little boy gave life to his dad because the transplant actually worked. Did you know he was actually cured of cancer? He didn't die of cancer. The transplant of the bone marrow of the little boy to his dad healed his dad of the cancer. His dad died of a virus that he caught while he was in the hospital waiting on the cancer treatment to take place. Didn't die of cancer. The little boy, I asked Lister Belt about this. I'm interested in some of these technical things and he said, you know, there's, um, there's the, when marrow comes out, I thought it was white. That's just the way, you know, I, I, I eat chicken and we used to, when, when you had to eat all the chicken, including the marrow. <laughs> in fact, most bones you had to, at least where I was, you had to do that. So I thought marrow was white. He said, no, no, no. He said that when the marrow comes out, it's actually pink. It's in a little pink bag, about a pound of it. I said, well, how do they get it into you? I said, I know they take it out of your son with a needle and then they must be going to bore a hole in your leg and then inject that marrow into the middle of your leg somewhere. Where's it going? Your hip? Or your... He said, no, 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 no. He said, don't you see this tube here? He said, it actually comes in in an IV. You hang up the marrow here and then it drips into the tube. And I said, well, how does it get where it's supposed to be? <laughs> he said, nobody knows. But bone marrow knows where it's supposed to be. <laughs> Wouldn't that be wonderful if all our people were like bone marrow and knew where they were supposed to be? <laughs> now the father, after he got this bone marrow, did not reject his son's cell because they're kin, they're kinfolk, they bonded physically. And of course, culturally, the same thing has to happen. The immune systems should have detected a strange cell and then built a defense and killed and attacked that cell, rejected it. That's what it would have done if it had been strange. But since this was kin, the immune system allowed that cell to come in. Now, in the case of AIDS, they say there is a deficiency in the immune system. So in the case of AIDS, the person actually lets the thing that's gonna make them sick in without the fight. <laughs> something called acquired immune deficiency. Immune deficiency. The immune system doesn't do what it's supposed to do. Syndrome, A-I-D-S, acquired immune deficiency syndrome. Well, it seems to me that we have something called cultural AIDS. <laughs> acquired immune deficiency syndrome culturally. That means the thing that we're supposed to reject because it's not kin, <laughs> we let it in. <laughs> and then it eats up the body. So that one form of homicide is cultural homicide. <laughs> not just the little children shooting each other, but that person in the community who passes on the alien matter to their children instead of the thing that sustains their life. The loss of community turns a community into a destroyed community and that's violence.
The loss of culture destroys the person, and that's violent. And what about this suicide? What about this suicide? See, genocide is somebody trying to get rid of you. <laughs> Homicide is somebody trying to get rid of you, trying to change you into something else. You know, I have, look, there's a wonderful book called Blacks in the White Establishment. You ought to read it. It's about black children that's pulled out of the housing projects and sent to elite white private schools and what their motives are. They've done a study on whether or not you could actually change Jewish children into wasps. <laughs> They'd actually done that study before and they found that if you took these children and you could keep them in another culture, you could change their loyalty base to something else. And this book that I'm telling you about is the same people doing that study on us. And one of the things they concluded is that not only could you take those little kids out of Harlem, you could put them in one of these elite private schools and you know they would succeed. They said not only did the children succeed, they thrived in spite of all the trouble, all the insults, all those things. The kids did well and competed equally with the children of the richest people on the planet and they had no problem. And they said their hope was that these children who had succeeded would one day come out of their communities, leaving behind friends, family, and the black culture as a whole. That's homicide. That's homicide. <laughs> so that I, I'm going to go feel more comfortable <laughs> with somebody else's family than I do with my own. Of course, then you're ready for a job in high places. Supreme Court. <laughs> but let's look at this suicide, though. What is this suicide? Suicide is not when somebody tried to kill your family, not when somebody tried to take you out one by one. Homicide. Suicide is when you do it to yourself. You ought to know something about suicide. One of the things about suicide that I found out, one day a lady from DeKalb County called me in Atlanta, that's out in the northeast of Atlanta, and she said she had gotten numbers from the Center for Disease Control on the suicide rates for black male and here's what the number said. Since 1980, the rate of suicide for black males has more than doubled from 5.1 per 100,000 to 12.4 per 100,000 up to 1985-1990. From 1980 to 1992, suicide among black males 10 to 14 years old increased more than 300%. For black males 15 to 19, 184 percent, it is the leading cause of death for 15 to 20 year old black men. Suicide. Now I'm not talking about cultural suicide at the moment, I'm talking about suicide. I'm talking about offing yourself with a gun with some gas or cutting your wrist or something like that. You know the funny thing about this? Up until a few years ago, black people didn't commit suicide at all. They weren't even in the numbers. And now the numbers are threatening to equal the white population. In fact, they say that more young people die now from suicide than from homicide. This is what the CDC numbers say. And they even tell us why. They say stress factors include humiliating life events. Think about that. How many times our young men are humiliated? Loss of an important relationship. Loss of a job. Self-criticism. Pressure to achieve. Family discord. Family problems. 
Now, before I give you the interpretation of this and what happened, I want to tell you that there's also some numbers on black women. And they find that the black men actually commit suicide more, but the women actually attempt suicide 18 to 21 times for every time they actually complete one. Which meant they have more attempts than the black male, but they just don't complete it. So both the men and women are in trouble. A study was done working backwards to interview the families of these young children to find out if we could see why they were committing suicide. You know what the study showed? In fact, they'd asked me to advise about what questions ought to be asked. And the two questions that I put into the questionnaire were the main two questions that showed what the problem was as the research came back in. It turned out it didn't have anything to do with whether they had a job or not. Most of the kids had jobs. Didn't turn any, out to have anything to do with whether they could read or write. Most of them could read. In fact, their suicide notes were in good English. <laughs> it turns out, though, that their families never transmitted to them anything about how to live and survive in a racist society. So that when they got to the point where they bumped up against the glass ceiling, they internalized and couldn't take it and did it to themselves. And the second reason, they found that one of, these young, one of the things these young men had in common was that they didn't belong to anything. They're out there on their own. <laughs> I knew that. I'm not a specialist in suicide. I'm not a clinical psychologist. I'm an educational psychologist. But I know what whole human beings are supposed to have. Whole human beings are supposed to have a family. Whole human beings are supposed to have a family that they call extended family. But for the African family, that's the family. Your collective community is your family. Whole human beings have that and you take children out, you put them in environments where they disconnect from the, the groups that mean something to them. The smart ones will try to create gangs and build the families that we didn't build for them. Build the loyalty that we didn't provide. Build the accountability, the identity that we never gave them. The others will commit suicide. But you see, what I'm concerned about are those who commit cultural suicide. See, any self-destructive behavior is suicide. This lady I was telling you about, who didn't have any Africa, said that we didn't have any, anything left of Africa. We're not distinct. We should give it up and join the others. I told her, I said, you don't know that you exist, but Cadillac knows you, you exist. She said, what do you mean? So I have this thing right here that I, I have a newspaper article on Cadillac. Focuses on black buyers. It's in USA Today, Monday, February 28, 1994. Now, why would Cadillac focus on black buyers? Because we used to buy 25% of their cars. And it dropped to somewhere way down at the bottom. I don't know what it is now. So when Cadillac found that black people weren't buying Cadillacs, white people were buying them. Once they put the North Star, white people jumped out of Lexus and back into the Cadillac. But black people said, no, we'll just stick with Lexus. So they said, well, how are we going to deal with this problem? Not the way my sister dealt with it, just takes a off the top of the head view of whether we exist or not. Cadillac hired some anthropologists and sociologists and psychologists to study black people. <laughs> and they found out certain things about it. And then they came back to their dealers and they say they put their dealers through a course in racial sensitivity so they don't offend black consumers who returned to Cadillac showroom. Said, 
The names of the people that they studied came from mailing lists to black publications. Like, they got the mailing list from Essence. They got the mailing list from Black Enterprise. They got the mailing list from Emerge. And they got the census data. And then they pulled a sample from that. And then they studied those people and what their habits were. And adjusted Cadillac's marketing practices to target it specifically to an African community. Why would you do that if they don't exist? They were told not to dismiss black buyers who may dress or talk differently than white buyers. <laughs> See, that might seem like common sense, but it goes against the fears of auto uh, salespeople who train in the automobile business, automobile business. Salesmen have been taught to size up the tire kickers quickly and not spend much time on those who they think are unlikely to buy, unlikely to afford a car. And they usually use attire and speech as the keys to making these judgments. They say, you can't do that. Brother may be talking funny with about 15 grand in cash in his pocket. You don't know what he's got. And so they had to teach Cadillac that. Cadillac actually had focus groups for blacks. They got young blacks to find out what they thought about Cadillac. And they did what they had to do. R.J. Reynolds did it too. R.J. Reynolds said black people are a special group. This sister who couldn't even see herself in the mirror saw less than the cigarette company saw. They knew that they weren't selling cigarettes like they wanted to to the black community. So they got their anthropologists, sociologists, and psychologists out and studied them. And they knew something about your ego. They knew that poor folk like us like rich names for the things that we wear. So they made a name of a cigarette just for black people called Upscale. <laughs> upscale. And they study you and know you like menthol. So they put menthol in your cigarette. But they know you don't like too much. So they put weak menthol, light menthol, menthol light in an upscale cigarette. And you like filter tips more than white. So they put filters on your upscale menthol light cigarette. And they even followed you around and picked up your empty cigarette package that was on the ground and noticed that you open your cigarettes more often than whites from the bottom of the pack because you don't like to crush your filter tip before you smoke your menthol light upscale. <laughs> so they decided they would pack the cigarettes in the package upside down just for black people who don't exist, according to this system. Who don't exist, you see? Everybody knows we exist except us. Everybody knows we exist except us because we make a conscious choice sometimes to commit cultural suicide. See, it seems to me that at some point, we have to begin to understand what all other groups understand. We have to understand that there is absolutely no way to solve the problem I've tried to identify other than to invent and reinvent the structures in the community to do this. The public schools will never respond to the things that I just raised here. I'm telling you, they cannot. They don't know enough. They're not gonna put the money into learning. They don't respect the culture enough. So we have to have a structure. Nothing happens by accident. You don't transmit culture values by accident. Children just don't learn those hanging around you. You have to set up systems to do that. Systems that involve all the children. We're not doing what we're supposed to do. Make this my final point on that. We're not doing what we're supposed to do because we're facing genocide, homicide and cultural suicide and somebody facing that is supposed to behave appropriately, right? Wouldn't you think that if 
something happened to you as you stepped out of this auditorium and somebody came up to you with threatening behavior, there's an appropriate response to threatening behavior. And if somebody walked out and ignored the threatening behavior, you say, that's a crazy person. Well, that's what we're doing. I told somebody up in Florida a couple weeks ago, the PhDs, they have a program in Florida, the McKnight PhD program. They got over 200 Africans getting PhDs out of those Florida colleges down there. Brother down there, real sharp, Ike Trice, uh, Ike Tribble. And some of us get to go down there and talk. Dr. Clark was down there this year because there are certain messages they don't get from where they are. And so I told them about the problem is not getting a PhD. The problem is not committing suicide <laughs> or not permitting genocide or homicide culturally to be practiced on you. You see, appropriate behavior, it seems to me, is not our standard response. And I've kind of psyched it out. I've gone around the country to see what we're doing. And every place is not like slave theater, I tell you. <laughs> A lot of people's response is what I call tables of 10. I'm getting ready, to, I want to write a book about it. I'm not going to say I'm getting, re I'm getting ready to write it because I might not write it. But it just would be a good book for me to write. Tables of 10. Because that's the typical response of black people to problems. It's the easiest thing that we can do. It's the only thing we can do without working. And that is to get in our organizations and rent a hotel from the people who make money off of us and have a banquet where we sit down at tables of 10 and where we pass out plaques and have a speech and eat and dance and go home after we have given two scholarships of $5,000 after we paid $500,000 for the dinner at tables of 10. It doesn't take anything. So maybe you only do one of those a year. Or maybe you got a whole network of friends and maybe you're in three or four organizations and I don't want to name the organization but you know what they are. Tables of 10 is not a structure for socialization. It's not the structure that will engage the children. It's not the structure that will inform the adults. We don't have a structure. We are laid back at our tables of 10, wondering what they're going to do next, wondering what they're going to do for us, wondering what they're going to do to us. It seems to me that somehow we've got to get not just certain information to the community, we've got to get the analysis to the community. Our community doesn't have the analysis. And for that reason, much of our leadership is misleadership because it leads us to the tables of 10, but not to the solutions of our problems. No more cultural genocide, no more cultural homicide, no more cultural suicides. Sankofa. Thank you. Genocide, homicide, and suicide. Let's give it up for Dr. Asa Hilliard. Tables of 10. Dr. Asa Hilliard, Tables of 10. We're getting ready to get out here real quick. We want everybody to hold hands. Two seconds fellowship. We want everybody to hold hands. It won't, it won't, your train's not going to leave about 15 minutes from now. I just called the conductor and told him to hold it up. While we are, while we are doing that, those UAM members, in the, remember to pick up your raffle tickets. Those who have not received raffle tickets, remember to pick up raffle tickets tonight. Those who have not seen, gotten raffle tickets, see Sister Leo Maddox in the back. 
24. 744 29 24. 744 29 24. Going once, going twice, gone. Nobody got that, right? All right, just put it one more time. Jordan. All right. 744-2922. Jones, a warm round of applause. <laughs> Brother Bill Jones, let's give him a warm round of applause from First World. Brother James Smalls, let's give him a warm round of applause. Professor James Smalls, let's give him a warm round of applause. Now it's about 1040. He ought to be here by now. Dr. Leonard Jeffries. Dr. Leonard Jeffries. All right. Dr. Leonard Jeffries. Is he in the house? All right. I was, I was out in Queens, and you did not make CMATAP, brother, as you promised. Oh, y'all did? Oh, y'all got there on Dr. Jeffries' time. All right. Y'all came in late. All right. All right. We're glad to have everybody out tonight. Uh, thank you very much. We certainly appreciate Dr. Asa Hillier. Let's give him a warm round of applause, Dr. Asa Hillier. Asante Sana. Asante Sana. And certainly, uh, we will go back and take a new look at the Shabaka text, Asante Sana. Now, we are about to go. We'll be back next week with a brother from the Shawnee tribe, Barney Bush, from the mountains of New Mexico. And we'll be here discussing Native American history and culture and we'll be talking about their struggles to save their culture and their history, which would be very much in line with what Dr. Hillier talked about tonight. And we'll be reminiscent of the struggles up at City College. We certainly want to come back next week and hear him. And we want Brother Sadu to be here with us next week. I see you back there. All right, be back next week, brother. Say do. All right, and finally, we want to thank Sister Rosalind Jeffers for giving us a great new dimension. <laughs> of Dr. Asa Hilliard, and then just one final omission I need to correct. We're glad to have Trenton, New Jersey, in the house tonight. Brothers Glass, thank you for, thank you all for coming out and thank you all for having us down and we'll certainly be back in touch. We're an African people, robbed from our homeland, robbed of our names, our languages, our cultures, our religions, our womanhood, our manhood, our sisterhood, our brotherhood, our motherhood, our fatherhood, our selfhood, our nationhood, and our self-respect. But we shall rise, never to fall again. Up, you mighty race, you can accomplish what you will. No justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. No justice. No peace. All right.
Patient. It gives me great pleasure this afternoon to introduce to you Dr. Asa Hillier. I first <clears throat> I first saw Dr. Asa Hillier in the early 80s, probably around 85, speaking at our uh, first ASCAT conference in New York. I first met him in 1987 when we went to Kemet, and I think we were on the same plane and we were all when we arrived in Kemet, we were all hugging each other, saying, we're home, we're home. And we hugged each other, saying, we're home, being so happy we're home. Dr. Hillier is a professor of educational psychology, was born in Galveston, Texas, on August 22nd, 1933. This is his biography that I got from the internet, by the way. And uh, some things were revealed to me, so I'm going to reveal them to you. After completing high school, Dr. Hilliard attended the University of Denver, earning his BA in 1955 and his master's in counseling in 1961 and a doctorate of education in educational psychology in 1963. He began teaching in the Denver public school system where he remained until 1960 after receiving his bachelor's. That year he began teaching as a fellow at the University of Denver where he remained until he earned his PhD. Joining the faculty in San Francisco State University in 1963, Dr. Hillier spent the next 18 years there. While at San Francisco State, he became the first department chairman and spent his final eight years as dean of education. He served as a consultant to the Peace Corps and as superintendent of schools in Morovia, Liberia. Leaving San Francisco State, Dr. Hillier became a professor at Georgia State. Today, he is the Fuller E. Calloway Professor of Urban Education, serving both as the Department of Educational Policy Studies and the Department of Educational Psychology and Special Education. He is a founding member of our association, ASCAD. He is our first vice president. He, served, he has served as an expert witness in court testimony on several federal cases regarding test validity and bias. And he is a co-developer of an educational television series, Free Your Mind, Return to the Source, African Origins. In 1995, he was selected as one of 30 movers and shapers of early education. He has written hundreds of topics on a variety, hundreds of articles on a variety of topics, including ancient African history, teaching strategies, and public policy. He's the recipient of the Outstanding Scholarship Award from the Association of Black Psychologists, a Knight Commander on the Human Order of the African Redemption, and the Distinguished Leadership Award from the Association of Teachers of Education. He and his wife, Patsy Jo, who is mayor of East Point, Georgia, have four children. Some of the books he has authored are 
the price they paid, desegregation in an African-American community, the Maroon Within Us selected essays on African-American community socialization, teaching slash learning anti-racism, a, develop, a developmental approach, know thyself, and he also introduced the teachings of Patahotep to us. Without further ado, it gives me great pleasure, and I know this will be a great learning experience for you, Dr. Asa Hillier. Thank you very much. Hotep. In recognition of our creator, the one who is hidden and who is the source of all life, power, and health, in recognition of our ancestors, the ones through whose loins we came, who set the pattern for us, who solved every problem that we need solved, and whose example, if we examine and follow, will work for us today as it worked for them in the past. But if we ever forget them, then nothing that we do will be correct. If we remember them, then they will join our efforts and bless them, and we will be successful. Ashe? Sister Keffer, Doc, Ben, I have your permission to continue. Thank you. Um, you know, this uh, morning I was speaking to my mother, <clears throat> who is now 92 years old. And as you know, when age sets in, sometimes memory fails. And in my life, I've never really been afraid of much. But the one great fear that I had when I was, <coughs> excuse, excuse me, extremely young, was that I would lose my mother before I would have an opportunity to say thanks in a tangible way for the sacrifices that she made, raising five children as a single mother. <clears throat> and I've been blessed because she's still here, but like many elders at the age of 90, memory began to fade. And um, she called me Papa when I called her. Well, you have to understand that Papa is the family member who took over when her mother died. And he was actually her stepfather. And she, he's been dead for 40 years. But when she talked to me, she called me Papa this morning. And um, a couple weeks ago, when I went to see her, she came to the door and embraced me. And then she said how sorry she was that she was foolish as a little girl, young woman really, and that uh, she, she said, I should never have left you. And what she was talking about was my father. And so at that time, I was not Papa, her father, but I was my father. <laughs> and she hugged me and talked to me as if she were my father, or her father, my father. And um, what had happened is when I was about two, my mother and father divorced. Both of them, it was one of those divorces, if divorces can be uh, harmonious, it was. Neither ever said a negative word about the other, and I never 
even until now, know what it was that caused them to split. And that was as close as I've ever gotten to even having a hint of why it was that at the age of two, my brother and I wound up in Houston, Texas. My dad stayed in Bay City, and then my mother and father both had three more children, so I'm the oldest of eight. Um, and <laughs> she, I felt good in one way that I, I suspected that it had to do with the fact that my dad was busy and that she felt that she didn't have his undivided attention and that uh, my mother was just as strong as he was. I have two very strong parents and my mother is very independent. Even now, she will not live with anybody. So we had to build her a house so she could live in her own house. And even now, with her failing memory, she will not move although I built a house in my daughter's yard so that she can go next door or they can come by and she can put the kids out, my grandchildren, whenever she gets ready. Now how do I deal with someone whose memory is failing? Well every time we meet, what I've learned is that um, she's always disoriented now, but all I have to do is start reminding her of the jokes we used to tell when I was little. And as soon as I get to those jokes that we used to have, we used to name people, we call them by funny name. Everybody had a funny name and we would have the biggest fun in our house with these secret names that we had for people. And every now and then we'd slip up and call somebody by their secret name that they didn't know they had. And so that would be one of the things that would get my mother laughing. And so once she went all the way back and got those memories, then we work up to the present, and then she could remember what happened this morning, yesterday, everything else. So it was a case, a living case of Sankofa, you know, going back to find out where you are, to get oriented. And I remembered that when I was coming here, because that's really what we're doing in ASCAT. Um, you see, without Without memory, there's really not much you can do. In fact, with no, without memory, you don't exist. Uh, so this is not something, this memory search is not something just so that we can memorize the seven principles of Ma'at, that we can, uh, the features of it, the, the, the behavioral, aspects of my that we can memorize those. That's not it. That what we're doing in memory is really coming to life. Because 99.44, 100% of who we are is what we were. And the present moment, as of this moment, what happened, what I just said, is memory already. So we don't live, we really live in memory and with memory in order to be able to go forward. And so, when Bill Bennett made his comment about the fact that you could eliminate crime by killing all the black babies and then add it quickly, but it would be horrible and wrong and so forth, I might have accepted that if I didn't have a good memory. But I have a great memory for the fact that uh, Bill Bennett has a very close associate at the Heritage Foundation named Charles Murray, who wrote The Bell Curve. And I remember that The Bell Curve was sponsored by the Bradley Foundation, and that the Heritage Foundation houses Bill Bennett and Charles Murray. And Charles Murray, I remembered in The Bell Curve, chapters 21 and 22, where Murray does the same kind of thing that Bennett does, implying that most of the people with low IQs, which is us, are worthless people, which he says, and really there's no way to get rid of them, which he says, and so therefore you have to stick them all in one community so they can stay together and the rest of the world can go about its business. Uh, so if you read the bell curve, that's the one you should read. So I remember that, and therefore I could put a different spin on Bill Bennett. And I remember that Bill Bennett was also the one who 
endorsed the book Cultural Literacy, uh, which is now something in the public schools called Core Knowledge, which is a curriculum that is being sold that glorifies Greece and Rome. And uh, the, uh, the, he's also a, a, a person who serves the interests of the Heritage Foundation, uh, the cultural literacy. E.D. Hirsch is the one who did that. And in fact, he served it so much that Bill Bennett said he wanted to take what was in cultural literacy and make it the new scholastic achievement test. In other words, the content of that, Greece and Rome, and its heritage. In other words, some people always remember, but they want other people to always forget. So they were putting the power, as he was then uh, the person who was in charge of the Department of Education, and which is another reason that his comments are so interesting and meaningful because I remember he had that job and responsible for educating the children and he wanted us to be Greeks and Romans. Um, and I remember that all these people seem to have the same address. You know, all the ones that I'm talking about right now. And that have so much to do with influencing us, especially with the current political crew that's in place. And I remember that he wrote a book of virtues because he said we weren't. And then he got caught gambling. And so now he's not only caught gambling, but implying murder with his virtues. So I remember, and I can put a judgment on the quality of his life. And I remember also that he's at home with the wife of the current vice president, Cheney, his wife named Lynn Cheney. She used to be head of the National Endowment for Humanities, and when Ali Missouri wanted to remember Africa, to try to put his version of the history of Africa back together again, they paid for that. The National Endowment for Humanity actually gave money to Missouri to do that. And then they showed about four programs because they thought he was gonna talk about trizophrenia, the Africans who were confused about who they were with triple heritage. That's what they thought the message was. And he, he had that. But he also had an anti-colonial message. <laughs> and they couldn't stand it. So Lynn Cheney went to the Congress to get Ali Missouri thing condemned, took the name of the National Endowment off of the program and stopped the series. So they never showed the whole series of the National Endowment. They say, you will not remember. So I remember not remembering. I remember that Bill Bennett also attacked me personally one day by saying some comment, I can't even remember the comment, but he said something about the fact that if you are going for African history, that's divisive. And then he added something like Hitler. But it seems that it sounds like he's the one that sounds more like Hitler, talking about genocide or implying it. So memory has a value, you know, otherwise you might just let that slide as, you know, he just made a mistake. But how if all your friends are in the don't remember process and even the don't exist process, then the meaning that you give to the comment is quite different. I remember Katrina. And I remember the victims of Katrina, uh, Katrina. And I remember victims going back after Katrina to try to put the pieces back together again, to go back to the old house that when you get back is nothing but a shell of its former self. And your stuff is scattered all around, whatever that is that's left. And you're hoping to get one little piece of something one little piece, if you could just have a piece, somehow that might make things a little bit better. So I remember the remembering of the victims in New Orleans. I also remember their victimhood. I remember them standing on the houses, waving, help me. And I remember all of them 
almost 100% were African on those rooftops. And I also remember that they had faith that somebody was coming, that one of those helicopters, the news helicopters maybe, which had no problem flying, but the army helicopters had problems flying. The cameras were there, but the military couldn't get in, the police couldn't get in to take people off those roofs. And even a helicopter company from Atlanta went down on its own initiative, ready to fly, and sat there and never got the orders to fly. They said, we'll go regardless. And that man was interviewed on one of our local radio stations, and he told the story of how he was prevented from going. And I remember that there was a hurricane in Florida, and I remember how much money the Floridians got. In fact, some of them got money and had no damage to their houses and large sums of money. And they were going to max the victims from New Orleans out at $2,000 per family if they would sign away their rights. I got good memories on some things. And I remember a public official saying that New Orleans was now gone and implying that that was great because he said, we've been trying to do this for a long time and finally God did it. And I remember that in New Orleans that hundreds of people tried to cross a bridge to safety. And the sheriff shot over their head and said, this is not New Orleans. You can't come this way. You gotta go back into the flood, go back into the danger because we don't have room for you here. And I was hoping that African people would not forget, but would remember all of these memories. You see, because there are other crises coming, and we'll be still on the roof, like many of us now, waving our hands in hopes that someone is coming. And when even one white uh, political person Mother died because he thought they were coming too, and he broke down crying, saying, nobody's coming to save us, nobody's coming. I said, well, if they're not going to save him and his mama, then all those Africans on the roof, they can forget it. And so maybe that's some kind of message that we ought to remember in order to know that we ought to remember. You see, because there are people that you know and I know who say, why are you studying all that black stuff? That was in the past. Well, there's one reason <laughs> I just got you telling you. Um, now, I remember other people's memories. I remember that every town I go into has a museum that preserves the memories of Europeans. Has libraries, thousands of books that preserve the memories of Europeans. We might have a book or two in there, Up From Slavery, you know, something like that. I remember that they have monuments all over town, even some resembling African monuments that Africans don't even remember are African, and Europeans don't remember are African, and their buildings are built on African patterns, but since neither of us remember, then we don't even know how to put a value on it, but they are remembering. I remember that there are those who are forgetting, deliberately forgetting. I remember Lynn Jeffries for the state of New York trying to remember in the curriculum inclusion. And I was a part of that effort and uh, you would have thought they were dropping a dirty bomb on New York. Wall Street Journal, New York Times, all these places went after Lynn, and they couldn't find anything wrong with the curriculum, so they decided to go get him for a speech that he made somewhere and pull a line out. They've been saving that for the day they needed it, and then when they needed it, then they diverted attention from the effort. And so I remembered the efforts put into not remembering. And I remember that Schlesinger wrote a book, The Disuniting of America. 
And I remember the first picture in there was my Linus picture. The second picture was my picture. And the third and biggest picture in there was Lynn. That's who they were scared of at the time. Then there was a picture of Dr. Clark. And then there were a few others. And of course, what uh, Schlesinger's was trying to do was to remember something that had never happened, a united America. <laughs> he said, so this was a group of people who by remembering, notice now, what was the crime? Remember. Because if you remember, then he sees that as dismembering America. But if we remember, we see that as unifying Africa. And of course, that's the problem the existence of African people. I remember that New York has burial grounds. And somebody remembered. I know that Brother James Smalls has been involved with that. I believe Brother Lynn and others. And, and they've been digging up stuff. And I remembered that just a few years ago, people said there was no slavery in New York. And now I just got a book from Amazon the other day, came to my house about this thick on slavery in New York. And it turns out not only was there slavery, this was one of the biggest slave areas of any city, any large city. New York had a thriving, decades-old slave trade and operation that we forgot. Everybody forgot. Until they dug up, they kept digging, it's, it's interesting, isn't it, how we don't have the money to do all this digging, but people who do dig keep digging up our stuff. They dig up pyramids, tombs, temples, mummies, and all of that, hoping that it's there, but they help us to remember. So it's interesting that in the New York burial grounds project that one of the things they dug up was people who remembered because on their coffins they had the same Kofa symbol right there on the coffin. Same symbol that they put in the wrought iron in North Carolina because they were the people making those iron fences. And they put same Kofa in the fences saying they wanted to go home. The Georgia Writers Project that interviewed Africans said that um, everybody dreamed about going back. And that's where we get this these kid stories now, but they were adult stories then, the people could fly. And that's what they said. You could, if, all you had to do is remember certain words that had power, and you could lift yourself up and take yourself back, because the goal was to go back, to go back to what? To go back in forward time, actually, to go back, to go forward. In order to, what is the back? It's back to unity, back to coherence, back to sanity, back to power. So you can do what? So I can use it now. That's why you go back and get an egg out of your behind if you're a chicken or the bird, the Sankofa bird, takes the egg out of behind. What is the egg other than the symbol of potential? The egg has all that it will become in it. It's already been fertilized. <laughs> it has all that it will become. All you gotta do is sit there and give it a warm environment. It will become its potential. I remembered forgetting, and I think uh, Baba uh, Smalls and Jeffrey were involved in this too. They're always somewhere in the middle of stuff. And that was taking Crystal and Carson back home when the DNA found out that they actually had a, an African from Jamaica and an African from New York City by DNA that come from Ghana, connected with Ghana. And they took them home in style, put them on the water in a ship and brought them to the dungeon back through the door that has now been renamed door of return. They said you weren't coming back. They said, but we back. And marched them through that door and then up into the interior to the last place where Africa got a bath before they came down to be brutally treated and handled in the enslavement. 
So I remember that too. And there's so much to remember. I remember forgetting. I remember that when I grew up, Timbuktu was a word that described something bad that would happen to you. Africans said that. Africans from Timbuktu, I'm sure the DNA will show. The grandchildren of Africans from Timbuktu, without memory, came to think of home as alien and came to think of an alien place as home. Memory is a funny thing. But then all of a sudden now you can go back and find out stuff that I couldn't find out when I was a child. Some of our greatest historians, they knew it was there, but some of them didn't have the documents to fill out the picture. They knew the story. They knew that Timbuktu had great university, for example. And when I get ready to show some slides in just a moment, um, hopefully you'll be able to see some of them. You notice that my slides are foggy, and that's because uh, we were bringing the projector in and it rolled down the stairs, and so it jammed the lens, and so I can't turn it and focus. That's why it looks like that. So I'm hoping that you'll be able to see enough that you'll bear with me. Now, if you're sitting up close, you can see it on the screen of the computer. And if you're taking photographs with the cameras, I would suggest that you photo focus on the, lens, on the screen of the computer rather than up here, because you're not going to be able to get any of, of the real good stuff, at least for the quality that the camera needs. Hopefully, it'll be big enough so that you'll see the, get the gist of what I'm trying to present. But this forgetting, this Timbuktu, how many manuscripts are there now? Or are there any now? Yep, turns out the archives of the university are still operating. Apparently they never shut down. They're still in Sankare Mosque, and there's about 18,000 manuscripts in Sankare Mosque. When I got to go there, I saw those manuscripts and. Actually, we got to handle some. And then recently, New York Times said that they discovered, they didn't discover, but they noticed or were told that uh, there were about 100,000 manuscripts in Timbuktu, not in the archives, in the homes of the children and grandchildren of the professors at that university. They preserved those. Man, most people keep those books in their houses. Yeah, well, that's not strange because Af to Africans, books were the most precious thing you could have. And that, according to Ahmed Baba, the, he had the smallest library on the campus. And there would be 1,600 and more books in the libraries. That meant in the houses of the professors, in their personal library, so that you didn't have to have all your stuff in the university library. And then the New York Times, in the same article, says there are a million manuscripts in Mali. That means all over Mali, the other two university towns, Jenny and Gao, and other places where scholars were. That means scholars all over Mali. That meant literacy all over Mali. Almost everywhere you went, Mali was the one place where you have literacy in terms that we understand now. Most places had literacy in other terms, symbols and things like that. So that's, I remember that we forgot that and that this is a shock. So, Last week, into my office walked a preacher from the Interdenominational Theological Seminary and a young man from Mali, and they had a suitcase with 25 of the manuscripts from the library of Timbuktu. Because <laughs> they're right now trying to, he had lots more, and he's trying to, he had a letter from the Antiquities Department indicating that he had the permission, these were authentic, and so forth. And then they told me something that they had not done. They said in, in their, they had a lot of people want to give them bunches of money, but they want to, they're not us, and they want to take the manuscripts and do what they want to do with them. You know those manuscripts need to be digitized, for example, and translated and then taught because some of them are really important. Like one manuscript that we saw 
they told us, the librarian said, this was a manuscript written by Ahmed Baba, and that the manuscript was taking issue with Machiavelli's The Prince, which is the book that the Bush administration and the corporate people in America, for the most part, you can buy it right now, you can buy the Machiavelli The Prince in the bookstores in the airport. Why? Because that's the value system in a dog-eat-dog -dog world. Now you can see why Ahmed Baba would take issue with it. That's why I wish that they hurry up and translate that document so we can see what his arguments were. This is pretty important, you know. Not only were these African literate, and I just read the other day where some of them came from Spain, having been driven out when Ferdinand and Isabella drove the Moors out of Spain, that some of those Moors went to the library. They'd been university professors in Spain and had been driven out, and some of them went, obviously, to Timbuktu and served as professors there. And there's whole bunches of stories. I've always wondered how they built such an expertise to be literally a world class. They tried to minimize what Timbuktu was. It was just a little country college. No, it was a world class university. And now the manuscripts tell you that. So what they gave me when, I, when they left after we talked and tried to brainstorm what we could do to support the effort without having people lose their rights to control the material and ownership and things like that, they say, well, here, we've not done this before, but I'm going to give you this manuscript. They gave me a manuscript out of the library for nine months. I mean, sorry, six months. I get to hold it for six months. So last night, I spent three hours, and that's why I missed my flight trying to get here to see you. I spent three hours on my computer starting, I thought I was going to be done in about an hour. I started at 11.30 a.m., and I didn't finish until three hours later, scanning the pages, 290 pages of a little bitty book like this, brilliantly written and with lots of diagrams and a whole, obviously a whole bunch of subjects. It looked like math and everything written by a woman. Written by a woman. Somebody is worried that we will remember. <laughs> Somebody is worried about a value system where men and women are scholars. Somebody is worried about a value system that's anti the prince. Somebody is worried about a value system that brings the people into consciousness of themselves and allows Africans not to be ashamed from diaspora to their home base. So that's the forgetting. So we didn't know how many, we didn't know how great the writings were. And all of a sudden, all this stuff is coming to life. Just like DNA is bringing connections of Africans to light. Oprah has now found out that she's Zulu. <laughs> Andy Young has now found out that he's Mende. See? People are finding out things that will make them stand still at least for a moment, and if they got any consciousness whatsoever, they got to start asking questions again. You know, Andy tried to he asked me, if, you know, a lot of little things in terms of history. When uh, uh, the infusion conference was held and a couple of times when Dr. Ben came, I tried to get books over to Andy so he could read. I gave him some of Dr. Ben's books, some of Dr. Clark's book, and a whole bunch of other books. I must have bought three or $400 worth of books that I presented to him. He got all fascinated and started lecturing on the books. He was running, I think, for governor at the time, went down to Tulane and was making a speech and they almost ran him out of town. And so he just decided he couldn't do the lectures anymore, but he kept reading. He used to read, he used to listen to the tape, you buy it right here, and so forth. So he got fascinated and said, well, if I'm Mende, who are the Mende people? You know, and I was trying to point out that the Mende people, like all the people in West Africa, are East Africans who move. You know? And so, therefore, you know that you have East-West merger in the West and some other things. Linguistically, we know this. Now you can find out through DNA. There's a lot of things. In other words, the ISIS function needs to be performed. I said, picked up the pieces of the body of African people 
in this case, Asar, her husband, representing the people, really. And she found that you could bring that body back to life, including its creative principle, the penis, so that you could procreate. Can you imagine taking a dead body, dismembered and remembering a dead body, and then revivifying a remembered body? And put it, what a model. That's how we are as African people, a body torn apart, taken everywhere in the world, needing to be remembered. And we use the word Sankofa for that. And now, of course, we're being assisted in this attempt to remember. So I want to do a little remembering by going, if I can make the technology work. Um, and I apologize to you for um, Okay, I'm going to have to do it the hard way, I guess. Just give me a moment to relocate down here on the floor. No. The other one. What? That one. This one? Yeah. That's yours here that I'm taking? No, that's the house side. That's, that's oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So that's I should take this one? Yeah, that's the house side. This one? Mm -hmm. before we had an ASCAP. We didn't have ASCAP until the next year. Uh, beg your pardon? No, that's Dr. Jacob Carruthers in the middle. Baba Jetty. Um, there were some other people, by the way, at this conference. That's not everybody, but uh, obviously this is the powerhouse. <laughs> um, uh, and of course, that's the powerhouse too, isn't it? Those of you in... Uh, East Coast area up here around New York and Newark, you know the African warrior scholars. And what I want to do is not start at Kemet this time, but start in Mali, in Timbuktu. And I want to show a few things and try to make a few points on Sankofa and remember it. Um, and I dedicate this to um, a person who has meant so much to all of us, uh, Dr. Yusuf Ben Yakana, uh, for <laughs> for a lifetime. And it would it would take me years, as you all know, to describe the sacrifices. The number of innovative ideas, all you have to do is go through Dr. Ben's books. And just, you don't even have to read the book, just read the titles of the books. And those titles were earth-shaking by themselves. 
Black Man of Denial. Just go back to the year it was published and say Black Man of Denial. You can say it now. It was hard to say then. And of course, my favorite, I've said this every time, cultural genocide and the black and in the black and African studies curriculum. That's what we were talking about, where people try to cause us to forget and prevent us from remembering. The African origin of the world's major religions. Yeah. Now everybody's saying that. Then nobody was. And so and of course, one reason that I'm doing this by visuals is that I started imitating Doc Bend as best I could when he was doing the same thing in his books. If you remember, his books had text and photographs sprinkled all through the books so that you went not just to the interpretation but to the evidence. And so I'm indebted to him and to Joel Rogers also both of them for following that pattern. And uh, it's made a big difference in terms of the ability to get certain types of points across. Um, I made mention of the fact, and I'm sorry you can't see the writing on this, that all West Africans and East Africans who move, the cradle of humanity as far as we know it, is um, in, uh, from Chad all the way over to Ethiopia and Kenya and places like that. And so the, everybody in the world came out of that navel and then moves to other places. And so you can never forget the connections of the West to the East. And therefore, you can never forget the connections of West and East to diaspora so that all Africans are related. And uh, these were some of the books. That one says the strong brown God. That's the story of the Nile. Uh, I'm sorry, the Niger. That's actually a photograph out of an airplane looking down on the Niger at a place called the Niger Bend. Some of you know that if you look at the map, the Niger actually starts on the left, goes up, and touches the Sahara and then it turns right and bends and goes back down and empties into the Atlantic, or what used to be called the Ethiopian Ocean by the European. Um, and this is at the bend of the Niger, and that's nine miles approximately from Timbuktu, where the University of Sankare Mosque, Sankare Mosque, which was the center of the university, and where the archives now exists for that one university town. Remember, there are also archives in Jene, also archives in Gao. This is not the only place you got archives. <laughs> not the only place. And these things are written by Africans themselves, not, and no Arabs are over here writing anything, even though they're written in Arabic in many cases. And these people in the West had highways on the desert and highways in the ocean highways on the desert and highways in the ocean before the slave trade. Highways on the, highways on the, in the desert so that people could leave Mali like Mansa Musa did and go all the way to Mecca and come back home and not get lost in the 1300s. That, that, that's pre-slavery. And even before that, they could go where they wanted to go on the desert and on the ocean. This is important because they have books. There's a book called Ancient and Modern Britons by MacRitchie, which is sold on some of our uh, vending shelves, that tells the story of the Fomorians, the African sea rovers who went up the coast of West Africa into Europe, into Scotland and England, and settled in those places. And in many cases, settled and even intermarried into the royal families of those places, people who were respected. Yes. Big pardon? Ancient and modern Britons, B R I T O N S, the British. Um, and of course, the mosque at Jene. Uh, again, apologizing for not being able to focus. 
This is another map on the right showing an east to west migration. And this comes from uh, Sheikh Anta Jap's book, Pre-Colonial Black Africa. And on the left, you have a listing of all the languages of West Africa that have an East African kinfolk origin. In other words, when we say these things, we have the documentation of a variety of sources. If we say they move, we can tell where the family that stayed is because they still have some of the same language that's left behind, like the language that their children speak in other parts of the continent. And that was a, these are, this is the streets of Timbuktu right now in Mali, one of the schools. And this is the mosque of Sankare, which we've seen so many times. By the way, they are still conducting their services in this mosque at this time. It's, a, it's an operating mosque. And mosques in the African world were also schools. So you had a church, but you had a school at the same time. And the schools in this case were schools. If you get uh, Obinga's book on the bio of the uh, of Ahmed Baba, he has a, a, a if you email me, I'll send the bio to you. you want to know it because it lists the publications that are known by name that Ahmed Baba wrote about. You know, the publications in philosophy, publications in theology, publications in mathematics, and, and so forth. And many of these publications still exist, by the way. Um, and that's the actual home of Ahmed Baba, which is uh, still standing in Timbuktu. And of course, the person who is in charge of our remembering is a professor at the University of Indiana named Hunwick, John Hunwick. He's the one getting all the money, millions of dollars to go to Timbuktu and to digitize and to organize and to classify and to preserve the materials in that, uh, in that city. And it's only recently that Africans have organized to take charge of a part of that process so we could do that for ourselves. There's a foundation, a Timbuktu foundation, and recently uh, South Africa has decided to join with Mali and to assist in providing funds so that Africa itself will be behind the preservation of these documents before they disappear. Million documents ready to follow. If you see the ones that I have, in fact, I have a picture of the one they brought to me, a couple pages of it in. Again, what did we forget? Here, I, I got so excited when I first saw this book, The Social History of Timbuktu. The Social History of Timbuktu. What is that? That's a, a book that gives the names of the faculty members who taught in the university and who they taught to be faculty members and who they taught. In other words, the genealogy of the faculty at Timbuktu. That's what this is. So it's not just one year that they happen to have a few visiting professors. They had an organized major international class institution, so much so that people would come from Egypt and try to get work at Timbuktu and they would reject them because the quality of their work was too low even when they captured them and took them to Morocco around 1600. When they did that, the faculty from Timbuktu, instead of being put in jail, some of them were put in the universities to teach in Morocco because they had such high standards for faculty at Timbuktu. This is world class. This is older. Timbuktu, by the way, is older than uh, Harvard, Princeton, Columbia, all of those, when we talk about the historically black institutions, we start usually with a United States institution. We should be starting in Kemet with the oldest historically black institution, the Petty Soot, in, uh, on the Nile River. That'd be the oldest. And then here we have, in more recent times, an elder, even for European institutions, located in the interior of Africa on the bend in the Niger. Yes. Uh, the uh, Saad, S A A D, Ellis Saad, S A A D. Thank you. 
You definitely want that for your collection. The golden trade of the Moors, most of us know that, I think, by Bovill, B-O-V-I-L-L. -L. And of course, the famous one that everybody wants, the Moors in Spain by Stanley Lane Poole. The Moors in Spain by Stanley Lane Poole. And I, I don't think I got a picture of Timbuktu the Mysterious by Felix Du Bois. Uh, there's a whole Timbuktu historical literature and that's worthy of keeping inside our houses for our children so that they will know what was going on there. Some of these stories are absolutely awesome. This pads in the rainforest that talks about how linguists trace the migration of people from one part of Africa to the other. And this is Christopher Eric's book, An African Classical Age, Eastern and Southern Africa and World History from 1000 BC to 400 AD the antecedent of the migration that go to West Africa. And remember I told you that Hunting, Hunt, Huntwick, Hunwick, H-U-N-W-I-C-K, is the professor at the University of Indiana who now has cornered the market on Timbuktu's money, money from this country that goes into finding and preserving manuscripts. Of course, if you find and preserve manuscripts, if you translate manuscripts, then the manuscripts say what you say they said. Now, I was in Timbuktu talking to the keepers of the manuscripts, and they told me that the manuscript that we had our hands on was the manuscript written by Ahmed Baba countering Machiavelli's The Prince. And when Hunwick was told that that manuscript existed, he said it didn't exist. He said it didn't exist, yeah. 15 minutes? Okay, all right. Is that a Jeffrey's 15 minutes or a regular 15 minutes? Okay, I'm gonna have to go on a little faster, I guess. These are the archives in the Timbuktu Library. And this is the case that holds the manuscript I was telling you about in the archives. And this is, these books, and the one that I have now, looks like this. They didn't have staplers, and they didn't glue these things together. The pages were loose. So to keep them together, they bunched them up and put them in a leather holder like this. And many of these manuscripts are now falling apart, as are the leather holders, like that one is being eaten. Here's another one kept in a box. And here's a man who's holding, this is one of the teachers. This is a man, when I went there, he's guiding tourists through, and I left his tour, because every time he stopped, he was talking about, this is where this... Uh, colonizer live. This is where this colonizer live. And I got so sick of hearing all the European colonized houses. You know, I didn't come to all the way across the water to go see some British houses in Timbuktu. And so he came and got me after he saw I left the thing. He said, he said, you got to stick with us. I said, why? He said, because there's something else for you which meant that for the Africans on the tour, they had another part that they were not gonna show the others. So what they did then was to take us to the archive. This man is now in the archive. He's holding a staff in his hand, if you can see it. That staff that he holds is what he uses to remember his 12th generation grandfather before him because that 12th generation grandfather was Ahmed Baba's teacher at Timbuktu. And this is the descendant of the teacher of Ahmed Baba, currently working in the archive in Timbuktu, and wants to come and see us, by the way. Um, and I, now you know I was happy because I actually got to do a workshop and a little mini lecture in the library at Timbuktu. So I ain't been the same since. <laughs> and that's uh, Sammy Seiko in the center, who is a Mali, former director of education. Um, the hand uh, that you see in there is actually over the manuscript that is the manuscript uh, that Ahmed Baba wrote countering the uh, Machiavelli theory. Then they, of course, took us out in the desert. They told us they are gonna take us to dinner. So they took us out where there was no light. I didn't know what was gonna happen. I thought they were gonna kill us for learning the truth and everything, but 
I was a little bit paranoid, I guess. And then they brought out all the dancing and everything, and we sat down on the carpets and ate some of the best goat you ever had in your life. <laughs> so it, it was something, it was something new. Now, last week, these, these are pages from the book that I told you about. And the two people who brought them, the minister from Interdenominational Theological Seminary, a young man on the right, is from Mali. And the little sticky pad in the upper left is a pad that tells you the name of the author of the book and that it was a woman. And it tells you things in French that I can't read. So I haven't gotten that yet, but I, have, I got my son-in-law to tell me some of that. But what I really want, and I'm, I, I scan this, I'm now going to pass this scan file on to somebody who reads Arabic so that they can translate this. And in fact, anybody that's got a um, flash drive out, download the whole manuscript for you before I leave. And you can have it yourself, all 290 pages of what's in this book. And you may know before I do if you can read Arabic. Because I think the important thing is to get the information out and you know not to uh, hoard things. But notice that, oh, oh, I'm so sorry that you can't see these clearly, but look at some of the diagrams. Book is full of all kinds of diagrams, things that look like mathematics, things that look like architectural drawings, things that look like games and everything. This, this is a very, very, very uh, text uh, coming out of Timbuktu. And of course, we don't know the age. And then, of course, these Africans were word-oriented. I want to keep going. Very literate, by the way. But we don't remember that we were literate. We don't remember that Timbuktu is in Dogon territory. So that not only did our people join the Muslim faith and learn the language of Arabic and write in Arabic, some kept their own systems like Dogon, 256 mother signs and 11,000 other signs to write the Dogon script, living now having migrated to these caves in uh, some parts of Dogana, as they prefer to be called. And those are, these are houses of words. The first building that Africans build when they build a town is not the sewer system, they build a house of words. That's where elders sit and solve the problems and build harmony in the community. Wouldn't that be something if we always had a house of words? Um, and of course, these are some of the, the Dogana elders. And I always like this picture. I wish you could see how regal these men are and that none of them are in prison. Prison is not the natural state for us. We're supposed to be thinkers, deep thinkers, models. Um, all houses of words. And remember now, I have a film that a brother just sent me. Some of you know among the Dogon, there's a ceremony that happens every 60 years. And what that's tied to is a lineup of the stars between Sirius, which is the same star in Egypt, <laughs> in, in Kemet. That star is the one that told them when the floods were coming. That star, that same star, is what the Dogon keep. And I have one paper that has about 42 comparisons between Dogon thought and Kemetic thought. But uh, this particular thing emphasizes the astronomy, the astronomical knowledge. And the movie that I have is when uh, an observer managed to get in on the last Siggy festival, the 60-year festival, when people come out and dance in imitation of what the stars are doing. That alignment, you know, when that's supposed to be on sacred space at a sacred time in memory of their ancestors, celestial and local. And then, if we remember, we'll remember this star, the main star, and we'll remember Benjamin Banneker. And all we know in February is that Benjamin Banner helped lay out Washington, D.C. But if we really remember, we remember that Benjamin Banneker's best academic area was not surveying and architecture. 
His best academic area was astronomy. And Benjamin Banneker was Dogon. That's the part that most of us never got. And to remember and to put him back in the context of his grandfather and father and mother from Dogana. And then we see that he had every right because the kind of knowledge that the Dogon have of astronomy, they possess before anybody else on earth, on earth possessed it, such as the knowledge of a star that you can't even see with a telescope. You can only infer it's there by what it's doing gravitational-wise to the big star that you're watching. And these people knew where it was, described it, described its weight, which is a star so big, so, so dense that it draws everything into it. And they say that's where we came from, our ancestors, the water spirits now. And these are some of their writings and that circle in the top, that's the, those are really, that's a text on astronomy if you know how to read it. But if you're a missionary and you determine that you know God and nobody else does, then you would call the people who are writing illiterate and you'd call yourself literate. Isn't that interesting? We still have things to learn. These are the Dogana and I learn more and more about the symbolism, what they're dancing and how they actually imitate that spiral around Sirius in their dance and how they wear on their head things that represent the configuration of stars and how the real glory for a young man is to be present at the Siggy Festival and be the one who wears the grand Siggy mask. That's the tall one, which is the star that actually goes around and represents the coming to the point that denotes the date. Do you think our children know anything about what I'm talking about right now? Do you think they would be interested in knowing anything? Do you think it would change their image of who they were? Do you think it would give them a different sense of destiny to be able to see themselves in terms of longitude and latitude, in terms of time, space, and change. What we've done is to be so dismembered that we become episodes rather than epics. It's time for us to remember ourselves so that we are epics again rather than simply episodes again. And of course, ASCAC is devoted to the recovery and reconstruction of the memories through Sankofa. And the Sankofa process is demonstrated and the rewards of the Sankofa process are raining on us now like never before. The books that have come out, since we were able to capture resources and location and communication in major universities in that thrust in the 60s, the things that have come out since that time are blowing our minds. There are so many that we can't even get them around fast enough. One of the newest books, that's two minutes, isn't it? And I'm already over 15. <laughs> See, I got the Dogon sense of sensitivity. And I didn't even look, and I knew that she was walking up. I even knew what was on her mind. So in order that I don't have to look back and, oh, I got five minutes. Oh, shoot. I guess I don't know everything. <laughs> I'll show a couple more slides, and then I'll, I'll shut it down. I thought I was already over. Again, uh, that's a Dogon door. When that young man put that mask on, that particular mask, I've never felt energy like that anywhere on earth. I mean, he was, he was a guy one moment, and then you go into the mask room. You can go anywhere you want to go. The mask laying all over the floor and everything. Mask doesn't come to life until somebody puts it on with a purpose. When they put it on with a purpose, and he, he, he came out with a sound through that mask that raised the hairs up on your back. And you looked at that mask, and it's not him anymore. It's something else. You know, and I'll never forget that. You know. 
And of course, he enjoyed it, and other people enjoyed what it does to people. Um, and they couldn't wait to show us. These are the Dogon. These people, you talk about ecology, living in harmony with nature. You talk about ma'at in farming. Harmony, balance, order, reciprocity. This is, look, at, look, at the, look at the green. <laughs> look at, they're not talking about pesticides. They're not talking about, you know, all the things, uh, fertilizers and things like that. They have almost all of that is natural and that food is absolutely incredible. This is the way we live, and then, instead of thinking that you got yourself a farmer, every last one of those people is a philosopher at the same time. Isn't that something? A whole society of philosophers who spend their time, when they farm, they're cutting rows in the ground, but those rows that they're cutting in the ground are simple, when they weave, they're like the master weaver of the universe, and they imagine themselves to be doing God's work. Every piece of an occupation anywhere is a spiritual expression of your relationship to the Creator. That's, that's who we came from. We came from people like that. And now we have come to people whose God is stuff, who are taking over the public schools to sell stuff, who are selling materialism, as Martin Luther King said, materialism, militarism, and racism are the values of the system that have to be changed. And shortly after that, he died a mysterious death because he called the name of the oppressor. This is a different group of people here. This is a different tradition. And the funny thing about it is that if we remember that means if we go to Haiti, if we go to Cuba, if we go to Congo, if we go to Dogana, if we go to the Juhoan people in Southern Africa, if we go to Kemet, if we go to all those places, if we go to the old sanctified church, we'll find that same spirit that came to us thousands of years ago and sustained us up until this very time. And we will come to a point where we will have supreme self-confidence in our ability, not only to lead ourselves, but to lead the world again. Thank you. Okay.